The uh, committee uh, will come to uh, order. I'd like to say uh, thank you uh, to our witnesses for joining us uh, to examine legislation introduced by my colleague, Senator Tom Carper, uh, to make the District of Columbia our nation's uh, 51st uh, state. I would also like to extend a, a warm welcome to Washington, D.C.'s delegate to the U.S. House of Representatives, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, as well as former Senator and also former Chairman of this uh, committee, uh, Joe Lieberman. Uh, certainly, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes uh, Norton, I appreciate uh, your attendance here today and just want to recognize uh, your incredible leadership uh, on this issue over many years. So it's wonderful to have you here before the, the committee. Uh, for, for decades, uh, you both have, Senator Lieberman as well, have served as strong advocates in the conversation to give D.C. residents an equal voice. And today, for the first time in nearly seven years, this committee will continue uh, that discussion and hear from the mayor, policy, legal, and civil rights experts on how lawmakers can finally, finally give D.C. residents the same representation in Congress as their fellow Americans. This lack of representation for the residents of the city, which serves as a beacon of freedom and democracy around the world, is a, is a stunning uh, contradiction. Since 1790, when President Washington signed into law the Permanent Seat of Government Act, D.C. has served as our nation's capital. D.C.'s more than 700,000 residents, many of them who have fought in our wars, paid federal taxes, and serve the American people in public service have been denied an equal voice in the formation of the very laws and decisions that govern them. And this is unconscionable. It's time to follow the lead of our colleagues in the House, pass the Washington, D.C. Admission Act, which will finally ensure that D.C. residents have the full congressional representation and self-governance that they deserve and that our democracy was built on. Our nation's most defining principle is that our government's power is derived directly from the people. It is why we elect leaders to represent us in Congress, and every American should be entitled to the same representation in our democratic republic, no matter which part of our nation they live in. When the founders first established a permanent seat of government at the site along the Potomac River, they could never have imagined it would become a large, vibrant, and diverse city with more than 700,000 Americans call home. And while we may hear a number of questions raised about this issue today, I encourage all of my colleagues to stay focused on the core civil rights issue that we have an opportunity to address. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and having a productive discussion today and may, and making the District of Columbia our nation's 51st state. And with that, I turn it over to Ranking Member Portman. Thank you, Chairman Peters. Uh, and thank you for our witnesses. Uh, we've got a distinguished group here today, including Eleanor Holmes Norton, Norton my congresswoman when I'm here in DC, um, and Senator Joe Lieberman, who is uh, back to this committee, having served as its chair and ranking member and and uh, really was the heart and soul of this committee when he was here. We're also going to hear from Mayor Bowser today. I appreciate her coming and, and a good group of academics. Um, as you know, Mr. Chairman, I have both practical and constitutional concerns about making Washington, D.C. its own state. Legally, Congress does not have the power to override the Constitution, and that's, to me, the most important issue here. D.C., of course, is the only place specifically created by the Constitution in Article I as the seat of government meaning it's got a special constitutional status, completely different from any current or previous U.S. territory that eventually became a state through the Article IV Admissions Clause. Our framers gave us a limited federal government, one in which Congress only wields the power explicitly granted to it. Here, neither the District Clause nor the Admission Clause provide Congress with the power to transform the seat of government into a new state. Moreover, D.C. has special constitutional status, of course, in the 23rd Amendment, which grants D.C. residents three electoral votes in presidential elections. We cannot just legislate over these constitutional provisions. Further, when Maryland authorized the cession of nearly 60 miles of its territory to the federal government for the creation of the District of Columbia in 1788, 
It did so for the purpose that, quote, Congress may fix upon and accept this land for the seat of government, end quote. When Congress formally accepted the land from Maryland by Legislative Act in 1790, we explained that the land was, quote, hereby accepted for the permanent seat of the government of the United States, end quote. Maryland gave up its land and we accepted it so that we could create an independent federal governmental district. Making D.C. into a separate state violates the solemn compact we made over 200 years ago with Maryland as well. And by the way, we'd be creating a state that by acreage comprises less than 6% of the next smallest state, Rhode Island. A better option, in my view, would be to retrocede a large portion of the district to Maryland. Retrocession is the preferable way to provide D.C. residents with voting representation in both chambers of Congress. This issue has come up before. The states declined to ratify the D.C. Voting Rights Amendment in the 1970s, which would have granted D.C. congressional representation in both houses of Congress and repealed the 23rd Amendment. Only 16 states ratified that amendment, 22 states short of the required two-thirds for adoption. Surveys today would demonstrate that the American people are still not interested in eliminating their capital district. Again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the witnesses coming today, and I look forward to hearing their testimony. Thank you, Ranking Member Portman. Uh, before we turn over to um, our distinguished guest and panel, I want to give uh, uh, the lead sponsor of the Washington, D.C. Admission Act, the lead sponsor here in the Senate, Senator Tom Carper, an opportunity to address the committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Colleagues, uh, I appreciate this opportunity. When, uh, and let me just welcome back uh, Joe Lieberman. It's great to welcome back to your home. And uh, thank you for your years of uh, leadership. And to welcome another Yale grad, uh, uh, Eller Holmes Norton. We two couple of teammates here. Great to see you both. Thank you for joining us today and for your leadership. Um, when Joe Lieberman left the Senate, he handed off uh, uh, a piece of legislation to me. And it's a piece of legislation that's before us today. Um, when summer ends and uh, school uh, resumes this fall, uh, millions of American school children will begin each day by uh, repeating uh, these words. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. One nation under God with liberty and justice for all. We are a nation of many faiths, Protestant, Catholic, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, and others. Each of these six religions share at least one thing in common, each of them. They share this admonition to love our neighbors as ourselves and to treat other people the way we want to be treated. The more than 700,000 citizens of the District of Columbia are our neighbors. They deserve to be treated as such by the rest of us in this country. They pay more on a per capita basis in federal income taxes than any of the 50 states, yet they have no vote in the U.S. House of Representatives or the Senate. They serve in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the National Guard, yet they have no vote in the U.S. House of Representatives or the United States Senate. The leader of every state is authorized to call up their National Guard in times of crisis, but we learned on January 6th that the elected leader of the District of Columbia has no such authority. The District of Columbia has earned a AA plus credit rating higher than most other states, yet the Congress has to approve the district's budget. And some of the finest judges serve on D.C. courts, but the Congress has to approve each one of them. And when the federal budget shuts down because of a budget impasse, it creates turmoil, budget turmoil, for the District of Columbia. And when the Congress fails to vote to confirm highly qualified judges for weeks, for months, and sometimes for years, justice is delayed and sometimes justice is denied. 245 years ago, 13 colonies took on the mightiest nation on earth, England, because of unjust treatment. They found particularly galling the requirement to pay taxes without representation. Taxation without representation became the rallying cry that led to our Declaration of Independence and a war to achieve it. The people of the District of Columbia have no interest in waging a war for independence. 
They just want to be treated fairly and justly. We should do that. And we can start doing that by enacting legislation that has passed the House of Representatives and is the subject of today's hearing. That is the right thing to do. The right thing to do. It meets constitutional muster. It puts the District of Columbia on the very same path followed by all 37 states who have entered the Union since, I believe, 1791. To paraphrase Mark Twain, when in doubt, do what's right. You'll amaze your friends and confound your foes. Let's do what's right. We start by treating our neighbors here in the District of Columbia the way we want to be treated. And oh, by the way, I want to give you another quote that may come as a surprise. It did to me and it might to you as well. Here's another quote. The fact that more than half a million Americans live in the District of Columbia and are denied a single voting representative in Congress is clearly an historic wrong and justice demands that it be addressed. I don't agree with uh, our former Vice President Mike Pence on everything, but we certainly agree on this one. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Carper, and thank you uh, for your leadership on this issue over, over, over many years. Bef before I introduce uh, our witnesses, uh, I want to give two uh, very important uh, guests an opportunity to provide uh, remarks. Our, our first uh, is uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, the delegate to the United States House of Representatives from the District uh, of Columbia. Congresswoman Holmes Norton has, without question, been the leading voice in this fight uh, for statehood, as she has worked uh, tirelessly, I think that is a good word to sum up your work, Congresswoman, tirelessly to provide her constituents with uh, equal representation throughout her 15-year, uh, or 15 term, excuse me, 15-term tenure in the Congress. She uh, recently led the passage of the Washington, D.C. Admission Act through the Congress uh, earlier this year. Welcome, Congresswoman. Again, thank you for your tireless uh, leadership on this issue, and I speak for the entire committee. We look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you very much. Microphone. Is it on now? I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman P Peters, on behalf of the 700,000 District of Columbia residents, including 30,000 veterans. I thank you for holding and for being an original co-sponsor, uh, uh, for holding this hearing and for being an original co-sponsor of the District of Columbia statehood bill. This hearing is of historic significance because it is only the second Senate hearing on our D.C. statehood bill in the nation's history. In the last year, the House of Representatives has twice passed the state, our D.C. statehood bill. In 1993, when I first came to the House of Representatives, I got the first ever House vote on D.C. statehood, but the bill failed because the House had a very different composition then. Prior to last year, neither chamber of Congress had ever passed the D.C. statehood bill in the nation's history. Senator Carper, I particularly thank you for, for sponsoring our D.C. statehood bill, and for being a champion for D.C. in the Senate where we have no representation. Following in the footsteps of Senator Joel Lieberman, under your leadership, the D.C. statehood bill has 45 Senate co-sponsors which is the greatest number of Senate co-sponsors of the bill in the nation's history. President Biden strongly supports D.C. statehood, our D.C. statehood bill, and is the first president to put the full weight of the presidency behind the bill in the nation's history. 
54%. That's a growing number. 54% of the American people, more than half of the American people, support D.C. statehood, according to a recent very detailed poll. This is the greatest support for D.C. statehood in the nation's history. Congress has both the moral obligation and the constitutional authority to pass our D.C. statehood bill. The country was founded on the principles of no taxation without representation and consent of the government, but D.C. residents are taxed without representation and cannot consent to the laws under which they, as American citizens, must live. The state of Washington, D.C. would consist of 66 of the 68 square miles of the present-day federal district. The federal district would be two square miles, and Congress would retain control over it as required by the Constitution. The D.C. statehood bill clearly complies with the Constitution, including the Admissions Clause, the District Clause, and the 23rd Amendment. Those who believe the bill is, is constitutional need only rely on the plain text of the Constitution. A group of very distinguished law professors and scholars from America's top law schools have sent a definitive analysis of the bill's constitutionality to the House and Senate leadership. You already have that, so I don't believe I need to ask that it be admitted to the record. The admissions clause gives Congress the authority to admit new sta states. All 37 new states were admitted by Congress by majority vote. No state was admitted by constitutional amendment and no state would have to consent to the admission of the state of Washington, D.C. The district clause gives Congress plenary authority over the federal district and establishes a maximum size of the federal district, 100 square miles. It does not establish a minimum size or a location of the federal district. Congress reduced the size of the federal district by 30% in 1846. The 23rd Amendment allows the federal district to participate in the Electoral College, but does not establish a minimum size or location of the federal district. Therefore, the bill complies with the 23rd Amendment. Nevertheless, the bill would repeal the Enabling Act for the 23rd Amendment, and the 23rd Amendment itself would be repealed quickly. The Constitution does not establish any prerequisites for new states, but Congress generally has considered three, population and resources, support for statehood, and commitment to democracy. The state of Washington, D.C. would meet all three. D.C. D.C.'s population is larger than the population of two states. D.C. pays more federal taxes per capita, and I will repeat that one. The residents I represent pay more taxes per capita than any state and pay more federal taxes right now than 21 states. D.C.'s federal domestic product is larger than 17 states. In 2016, 86% of D.C. residents voted for statehood. D.C. residents have been petitioning for voting representation in the Congress and local autonomy for, for all of its 220 years of existence from the moment this became the capital of the United States. Congress does have a choice. It can continue to exclude 
D.C. residents from the democratic process, forcing them to watch from the sidelines as Congress votes on federal and D.C. laws and to treat them, in the words of Frederick Douglass, as aliens, not citizens, but subjects. Or it can live up to our nation's founding principles and pass our D.C. statehood bill. Again, Chairman Peters and Senator Carper, thank you for your leadership on this bill. I look forward to continuing to work with you and your colleagues to enact this D.C. statehood bill this Congress. Thank you again. Congresswoman uh, Holmes Norton, thank you uh, for your statement, and again, thank you uh, for your leadership uh, on this issue. Our second guest is uh, Senator Joe Lieberman, who represented Connecticut in the Senate for 24 years. Senator Lieberman served as both the chairman and the ranking member of this uh, very committee. In 2012, he helped author the New Columbia Admissions Act, the first D.C. statehood bill to be introduced in the Senate in nearly 20 years. Senator Lieberman, uh, you may proceed with your statement. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, and uh, members of the committee for uh, convening this hearing today and uh, for giving me the honor of uh, testifying. Delegate Norton, Mayor Bowser, and other distinguished witnesses, it's a pleasure to be with you here. Uh, as Senator Carper alluded to, uh, just a few years ago, uh, Delegate Norton and I were at law school together, and uh, uh, we haven't aged at all uh, since then. I, w I, th I will point out um, that the mascot of, uh, we, have, we were lucky to go to Yale, the mascot at Yale is a bulldog, and I don't think anyone would argue with me if I said that Delegate Norton on this particular issue, many others, has had the tenacity of a bulldog, uh, occasionally the bark, and if necessary, the bite. Uh, so. It's always good to be on her side. Uh, a special thank you, talking about tenacity, uh, to Senator Carper, my dear friend, for introducing and advocating uh, this legislation, which really would right a wrong that has been done for too long uh, to the residents of the District of Columbia. Uh, I'm honored, really personally, to have the opportunity to return uh, to this committee in this room where I spent uh, so many of the best, most productive uh, days of my 24 years in the U.S. Senate, um, in large part because uh, uh, I was privileged to work in bipartisan partnership with the leading Republicans on the committee during that time, first uh, Fred Thompson of Tennessee and then uh, for more than a decade, Susan Collins of Maine. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, spirit of bipartisanship, uh, which has been part of this committee's history and really has been exemplified, I think, already this year by uh, Chairman Peters and Ranking Member uh, Portman, will guide your committee's consideration of the deprivation of voting representation in Congress for citizens of our capital city. As you know, as um, far as anyone can tell, the only citizens of any capital, of any country in the world, who are disenfranchised in this way. I first introduced legislation uh, on this subject uh, in 2002, uh, when some of the current committee staff members were probably in elementary school. Um, it was called the No Taxation Without Representation Act and was, uh, I'm pleased to say, reported favorably from the committee but was not acted on by the Senate. In 2009, uh, a group of us introduced the D.C. House Voting Rights Act, which was favorably reported by this committee and, in fact, passed by the Senate in a vote of 61 to 37. Unfortunately, however... The Senate added an amendment that repealed uh, D.C.'s gun control laws, and therefore the House never acted on the legislation. 
Uh, in 2012, which was my last year in the Senate, a group of us introduced the D.C. statehood legislation, which is very much like Senator Carper's initiative that is before you today. But uh, Senator Carper's done a much better th job than I did. <laughs> He's got the largest ever number of co-sponsors uh, for this legislation. It's really a tribute uh, to the cause and to his tenacity and advocacy. When Senator Carper asked me uh, if I would get involved in supporting the current proposal, I immediately said yes. The truth is I was very grateful to Tom for giving me the opportunity to re-engage in this constitutional cause that's mattered to me for a long time. And it's mattered to me because there are two great American constitutional principles that are, there, that are at the heart of the cause of D.C. statehood and that are violated every day uh, in the current tre treatment of residents of the District of Columbia. Both of these principles were central to the American Revolution against the British Crown. The first is that governments should govern only with the consent of the governed not by the whim of the crown or any other leader, particularly not a dictator. And that in a great democracy, a republic like ours, that consent is given by the votes of the citizenry. The second, uh, as has been mentioned, a great founding principle is that citizens uh, should not and cannot uh, be taxed without representation in the legislative body that taxes them. And here, in general, I quote Justice uh, Hugo Black, who wrote in Westbury versus Sanders, a 1964 uh, Supreme Court decision, no right is more precious in a free country than that of having a voice in the election of those who make the laws under which we must live, end quote. Uh, today's residents of the District of Columbia, as has been said, have every right to sound the battle cry of our revolution, no taxation without representation. Uh, greater per capita income tax paid from residents of the district and more in total than uh, the residents and citizens of 21 other existing states. So why would anyone not want to eliminate these grossly outdated un-American inequities? Uh, today, you will hear some arguments why from the witnesses who will testify against Senator Carper's legislation. I must say respectfully that I've, I've heard the arguments before many times over the years, and uh, uh, I suppose as judges say, I've reached a decision <laughs> All the arguments seem to me to be legalistic uh, disputations and ultimately excuses for something that is inexcusable. The arguments against this legislation don't come near to overcoming the great principled constitutional arguments for it. So what's the problem? Well, the media suggests it is not constitutional or philosophical, but political and partisan, that Republicans today fear that granting equal voting representation in Congress to D.C. residents will inevitably lead to two more Democratic senators and one more Democratic member of the House. I hope that is not the problem, because it is self-evidently unacceptable in America con to condition the enjoyment of constitutional rights on political party membership, any more than Congress would condition access to constitutional rights on citizens' race or gender or religion or sexual orientation. Besides, uh, it's just not sensible to base one's vote on this legislation which would correct an injustice forever on a short-range political prediction, which, based on history, may well turn out to be baseless or at least temporary. 
who among us can really predict how the citizens of the state of Washington, D.C. will vote in elections for the representatives in Congress in 50 years or 20 years or even five years? For example, who would have predicted five years ago that the state of Georgia would elect two Democratic senators uh, to this Congress? Who could have predicted 30, 40, 50 years ago that there would be almost no Republicans from New England, my part of the country, in the Senate today, and almost no Democrats from the House, which is obviously why we were so surprised by the election of the two Democrats from Georgia. A look at American history shows that partisan anxieties have been common when states have been considered for admission to our union since the original 13. But 37 times these anxieties were overcome to enable us to become the United States of America we are today. Here's an example which I think proves the, um, the difficulty of deciding this issue ba based on uh, political predictions. In 1959, uh, Alaska and Hawaii were both seeking admission to our union. Uh, there was a lot of concern about uh, how the citizens of those states would vote. Uh, they were essentially both admitted together, though there was a separation of a few months, because they were expected to balance each other politically. Alaska was expected to vote Democratic, and Hawaii was expected to vote Republican. That was the bipartisan consensus prophecy in 1959. I could tell you in my 24 years in the Senate, and still today, the opposite <clears throat> is the case. Hawaii elects Democrats and uh, Alaska has elected Republicans. So much for deciding great constitutional issues such as this one because of passing political uh, prognostications. It's not only a weak basis for judgment, uh, it's unacceptable in our system of law and equity. Mr. Chairman, many times in my 24 years on this committee, our members were able to find bipartisan solutions to difficult problems, and then to convince the Senate uh, to agree with those solutions, and together we got some great and good things done for our country, I'm proud to say. Uh, I hope you members of the committee in this session will similarly rise to the challenge of this moment and this problem and work together to get something good and great done for our country, our Constitution, and for the people of our capital city. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Lieberman and uh, Congresswoman Holmes Norton, uh, for uh, your perspective uh, on this issue. I'd now like to invite our witnesses uh, up to their chairs and to get settled. And uh, as uh, we are making uh, those uh, changes, as the witnesses are coming to their seats, uh, I'd also uh, like to welcome uh, our esteemed guest uh, to stay for the remainder if, uh, of the hearing if their schedules uh, allow. Uh, as we set up to move into the next phase of this uh, hearing, I hope my, my colleagues will pause and reflect on the remarks of Representative Norton and, and Senator Lieberman uh, with their depth of knowledge uh, and experience working to provide D.C. residents uh, with an equal voice in our democratic process I think they have set the tone uh, for today's uh, very historic uh, hearing. Today's hearing is not about uh, political posturing, uh, and it shouldn't be predicated on predetermined uh, views. It is simply about providing D.C. residents full and equal democratic uh, rights. President Eisenhower, I think, said it best in his 1954 State of the Union address, and I quote President Dwight Eisenhower when he said, quote, in the District of Columbia, the time is long overdue for granting national suffrage to its citizens and also applying the principle of local self-government to the nation's capital. 
67, that was uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and now 67 years later, those words still ring true. Like folks throughout our nation, uh, my constituents, and I know the constituents of everyone in this committee, uh, deserve a complete voice uh, in government. It's long past time for the Senate to pass this act. Uh, and uh, now that the witnesses have been uh, settled, uh, I would like uh, each of the witnesses to know that the, it's the practice of this committee, Homeland Security and Government Affairs, to swear in witnesses. So if you will uh, rise and raise your right hand. We have witnesses uh, also on video. If you would do the same, I'd appreciate it. Do you swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You may be seated. Our first witness is Mayor Muriel Bowser, the eighth mayor of the District of Columbia. In her role, Mayor Bowser serves as the District of Columbia's chief executive and functions as its governor, county executive, uh, and mayor. You have a lot on your plate, uh, Mayor, and it's certainly wonderful to see you here before the committee today, and you may proceed uh, with your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, and members of this esteemed committee, thank you for convening this hearing on S-51, the Washington, D.C. Admission Act, which provides the 700,000 residents of Washington, D.C. full democracy. I am Muriel Bowser, Mayor of Washington, D.C., and I'm honored to come before this committee with a simple request. Senators, we ask you to right the wrong that occurred some 220 years ago when the residents of the District of Columbia were stripped of their full congressional representation, and we ask you to do it now. The Constitution left the issue of democracy for residents of the District of Columbia to the Congress. The House of Representatives has passed the Washington, D.C. Admission Act twice, and the White House has indicated its support for the, for the bill through a statement of administration policy. Our democracy is truly in the hands of this Senate. It is the time for the U.S. Senate to support the D.C. petition for statehood. My testimony today echoes the many arguments that I made before the House Committee on Oversight and Reform in March uh, and in September of 2019. And some of the same arguments made by my predecessor in this very room in 2014. Then, as now, the district's call for full democracy has been drowned out by arguments that ignore the fact um, that the second-class status of D.C. residents is clearly an anomaly of the United States Constitution, not a feature of it. Over the decades, arguments against D.C. statehood have ranged from uh, assertions that are, quite frankly, preposterous to inaccurate legal claims. Just to cite a couple, in 2019, we were asked what would happen to the parking spaces for congressional staff if the district were to become a state. We were at a loss uh, to see how our full democracy uh, should be equated to just a few parking spaces. This March, I was confronted with concerns that the district could not be a state uh, because it was believed that we didn't have a car dealership, even though we do. Statements like these uh, not only discount the civil rights of DC residents, they also demonstrate a true lack of understanding of the rapidly growing and thriving businesses, neighborhoods, and culture that surround the small federal presence. It is for uh, those neighborhoods and those people, the neighborhoods of Michigan Park, uh, where I was born and raised, Congress Park, and Mount Pleasant, Columbia Heights, and Hillcrest among them, that make up 99% of the district. And the people who live in them uh, who have come to D.C. for school, government service, or other work, I appear today to represent them. There is no legal or constitutional barrier to D.C. statehood. The prevailing constitutional issue is the civil rights violation of 700,000 D.C. residents who fulfill all obligations of United States citizenship, but are denied any representation in this body. We say, 
Uh, and we rely on the opinions of 39 legal scholars who have submitted testimony to you unequivocally that the bill before you, S-51, the Washington, D.C. Admission Act, is constitutional. Dozens of America's most recognized constitutional experts have testified before Congress and penned letters to that effect. Scholars and experts have opined that it is fully within Congress's power under the Constitution to make D.C. a state through the passage of F-51. The Constitution's admissions clause grants Congress authority to admit states into the Union, including Washington, D.C. Following the 13 colonies, all 37 states were admitted by Congress through this constitutional authority. States were added solely, be, were not added solely because of a particular industry or the size of its land mass. Uh, states were added uh, to include the people. The Constitution's district clause poses no barrier to admitting D.C. as a state either. The district clause sets a maximum size of 10 square miles for the federal district, not a minimum size. S1, S51, of course, retains a federal district as required by the Constitution. It encompasses the unpopulated areas that make up the federal presence, including all of the House and Senate office buildings, the Capitol itself, of course, the Supreme Court building, the White House, the monuments and museums on the National Mall, and all of their federal buildings and land. The people of America, when they come to the nation's capital, they will still find all of the great monuments and museums that make up their experience, and of course, the free museums of the Smithsonian Institution. The 23rd Amendment to the Constitution, which granted D.C. residents a vote for president in 1961, does not pose a constitutional barrier to statehood either. The bill addresses it head on by repealing statutory language that enables the appointment of electors and it includes expedited procedures for consideration of the repeal of the unnecessary constitutional amendment, thus virtually ensuring quick and certain ratification by the states to ensure no ambiguity about the electoral votes. S-51 outlines a clear path forward on how to address the 23rd admission post-DC's admission. It is particularly contradictory that the 23rd Amendment, which was passed to expand democracy to taxpaying D.C. residents, is now being held up as the main barrier to further expanding constitutional rights in the district. This flies in the face of the amendment's intent. Retrocession to Maryland is also not required, uh, nor is it addressed in the Constitution. Maryland has no claim to the land it ceded to the federal government when the district was founded. Uh, certainly, no one in this body would suggest that Maine should retrocede to Massachusetts or that West Virginia should return to Virginia. Of course not. To be clear, D.C.'s current status is due to generations of an inactivity by lawmakers, including um, the founding fathers themselves, failing to address the contradiction that D.C. residents of the U.S. Capitol are treated as second-class citizens. With no constitutional underpinning, the disenfranchisement of Washingtonians is uh, a glaring civil rights and voting rights issue uh, of our time. In fact, we are the only capital, as, it, as has been stated, uh, in uh, the world's democracies without voting rights in the national legislature. In two weeks, the country will celebrate our Independence Day and the establishment of the United States as a sovereign nation, free from taxation without representation. Yet the 700,000 predominantly black and brown residents of Washington, D.C., have continued to pay taxes without representation for over 200 years. As we celebrate our nationhood, I appeal to this Senate to end the ongoing systemic injustice faced by a growing population in D.C. Uh, and vote for statehood in the 117th Congress. We cannot emphasize enough the civil rights and full democracy of D.C. residents is in your hands. 
We are 700,000 people, some born here, others from all 50 states and many nations in the world. We are Washingtonians who serve proudly in our military and fight for our country, and we are 30,000 veterans of our armed forces. We are Washingtonians. We have served on the front line as essential workers during this pandemic, doctors, nurses, firefighters, school teachers, and yet we have no say in this Senate. We are Washingtonians who heroically defended our nation's capital during the January 6th insurrection by answering to the call to support our federal partners, despite not having any representation in the Senate. We are Washingtonians. Uh, we don't have any say uh, when this Senate considers presidential nominations, Supreme Court justices, and large investments like the CARES Act or the American Jobs Plan. I ask you today to treat D.C. residents the same as all tax-paying Americans. Your inaction could doom yet another generation of Washingtonians to being locked out of their constitutional power and human rights. Will this body perpetuate this civil rights and voting rights wrong? By what authority would this body continue to have Washingtonians pay federal income taxes without a voice? Today, I'm asking that the United States Senate usher in a new age of fairness and equality for D.C. residents. One thing I know about D.C. residents uh, is that they have been fighting uh, for this for 220 years. We will not quit until we achieve full de democracy. And our two senators are seated here with you. D.C. residents are not standing alone. Over the years, we have garnered the support of Americans of all stripes and beliefs, the bipartisan United States Conference of Mayors, for example, representing millions of Americans in big cities and small towns, the nonpartisan League of Women Voters, who for 100 years have fought to defend our democracy, the NAACP, the Human Rights Campaign, and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, who recognize D.C. statehood for the civil and human rights contradiction um, that it is. To your former colleague and independent Senator Joe Lieberman, whose focus on justice and fairness makes plain why partisan considerations have absolutely nothing to do with the quest of D.C. citizens for full democracy and absolutely no place in, in assuring the S-51 moves forward in the 117th Congress. Uh, finally, uh, Chairman, together uh, with leaders across America, we know that we will keep pushing until D.C.'s tragic disenfranchisement is rectified. You have the power uh, to make two things happen that I see so clearly in my mind's eye and feel so deeply in my heart and soul. With your courageous leadership and clear-eyed focus on fairness and perfecting our union today, this session, this Congress, you will vote to admit D.C. into our great American union. And secondly, and prayerfully, I will be the last D.C. mayor who needs to sit here demanding on behalf of our 700,000 residents what is our birthright and what is owed to us as taxpayers, and that's full citizenship and democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senators, and we're happy um, to take your questions. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor, for your, for your opening statement. Uh, our next witness is Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League, the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban advocacy organization. Mr. Morial previously served as Mayor of New Orleans, a Louisiana State Senator, and was the President of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Welcome, Mr. Morial. You may proceed with your opening comments. To Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman and members of the committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Washington, D.C. Admissions Act. Uh, as Chairman Peters indicated, I'm Mark Morial. I'm president and CEO of the National Urban League. In addition to serving as mayor of New Orleans and a Louisiana state legislator, I'm also a former Senate, Senate staffer, uh, having served for the late Russell B. Long of Louisiana uh, in the 1980s. I also am proud to say that uh, uh, Congresswoman Norton taught me both uh, 
civil rights and constitutional law when I was, I was a student at Georgetown University Law Center and a resident of the District of Columbia from 1980 to 1983. And I thank her and Mayor Bowser and Senator Lieberman for their testimony and their leadership on this important issue. We, the National Urban League, were founded in 1910. And we've served the District of Columbia through both the Greater Washington Urban League since 1938 and the Washington DC Bureau of the National Urban League since 1962. On behalf of all of our members and supporters across the nation, I urge the Senate to pass this legislation to remedy the disenfranchisement of nearly 700,000 Americans. Throughout my career as a voting rights activist, a civil rights lawyer, and an elected official, I have had a long-standing passion in the DC statehood movement. While in law school in Washington, I grew to know and love this community and made the city my second home. From 2006 to 2010, I served on the DC Statehood Commission, where we pushed for DC statehood and statutory representation. Despite the progress we've made in the fight against disenfranchisement over the 200 plus years, DC residents have been pushed to the sidelines as spectators and continue to be deprived of full representation. They are unable to bring grievances to influential federal officials, reap the benefits available to other congressional constituents, or have a say in the important issues of war and peace that confront this nation. As a civil and human rights services organization, the National Urban League is in a unique position to see how this lack of representation acutely impacts DC residents during the COVID-19 pandemic. DC residents were in dire need of the relief afforded under the CARES Act. However, they did not have congressional representation that could offer amendments to or vote on the final bill. And DC was originally denied some $755 million in critical funding that it needed to provide direct relief to its residents. Last summer, DC residents took to the streets to exercise their First Amendment rights to peacefully protest racial injustice and police brutality. In response, the then administration gave orders to the National Guard and federal law enforcement to carry out a disproportionate and inappropriate response in the interest of a photo op. The same administration refused to call in the National Guard in response to a violent attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th until much of the damage had already been done. In both cases, DC officials were absolutely powerless to respond to critical events that were happening to their own people because the district did not have statehood and the critical safety mechanisms that statehood provides. DC residents are not able to hold elected representatives accountable for these harms. There was no DC elected congressional representative to vote to establish the independent January 6th commission to investigate the attack on the US Capitol or on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which would put in place critical policing reforms. We are at a unique juncture in American history where we can create laws that reflect our democratic values and principles and ensure that the fundamental right to vote, which is the foundation of all rights, can be exercised by all American citizens. We cannot let this moment pass. It is time to enact the Washington DC Admissions Act. I wanna thank Senator Carper for calling attention to this issue by introducing the Washington DC Admission Act in the Senate. And I applaud all of the testimony herein. This is an injustice. This is a denial of voting rights. This is something that should be remedied now. 
So I urge this committee to stand up for American values and for democratic principles and pass the DC statehood bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Morial, uh, for uh, your opening uh, statement. Our next witness is uh, Richard Primus, the Theodore St. Antoine Collegiate Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School, go blue. Professor Primus is an expert in congressional law. He is the recipient of the first ever Guggenheim Fellowship in Constitutional Studies for his work on the relationship between history and constitutional interpretation. He also clerked for the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. Professor Primus, uh, welcome. Uh, you may proceed with your opening comment. Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, members of the committee. Uh, my name, as the chairman says, is Richard Primus. I am the Theodore J. St. Antoine Collegiate Professor at the University of Michigan Law School. I'm honored by your request that I participate in today's proceedings. I want to recognize Chairman Peters as my own senator and Ranking Member Portman as a distinguished graduate of the law school where I teach. And I thank the Michigan law students who helped me prepare uh, Ruby Emberling, Savannah Grice, Rob Lothman, Thomas Clone, and Tyler Washington. The constitutionality of S51 is straightforward. The admission clause of Article 4, Section 3 empowers Congress to admit new states subject only to the limitation that Congress cannot unilaterally reconfigure existing states. S51 would not reconfigure any existing state. It would simply take American territory that is not currently a state and make it one. That's exactly what the admission clause empowers Congress to do. Some say that this admission would require a constitutional amendment, but the Constitution doesn't say that. The Constitution gives the power to admit new states to Congress, not jointly to Congress and the state legislatures by way of constitutional amendment. Still, some Americans have the intuition that something would be constitutionally amiss about making most of what we know as Washington, D.C. into a state. And that intuition, which I think many people hold on a good faith basis, is based on our knowledge that the founding generation didn't intend Washington, D.C. to be a state. And it's true, the founding generation didn't intend Washington, D.C. to be a state. But the founding generation also didn't intend to create a situation in which 700,000 Americans would have no voting representation in Congress. For the founders, no principle was more central to the Constitution than representative government. In their time, there was no conflict between that principle and the non-state status of Washington, D.C., because virtually nobody lived in Washington, D.C. But today, there is a conflict. The number of registered voters in D.C. today is larger than the entire number of voters who participated in all of the elections for all of the conventions that ratified the Constitution in all 13 original states together. On any constitutional vision that takes representative government seriously, that's a serious problem. And given the importance that the founders attached to representative government, it would be strange to conclude that their vision requires us to maintain a situation in which so many American citizens lack representation. And fortunately, it doesn't. The Constitution they adopted gives Congress a tool for solving the problem. That tool is the power to admit new states and give representation to Americans who currently lack it. So S-51 is not at odds with the Founders' vision. On the contrary, S-51 helps fulfill what is most important in that vision. Before I close, I should say a word about the ideas expressed in the written testimony of two witnesses with whom I have the honor to share this meeting, uh, Professor Derek Muller, and Dr. Roger Pilon. Professor Muller cautions that S-51 could cause confusion at the next presidential election given the 23rd Amendment. I agree with Professor Muller that the best solution is to repeal the 23rd Amendment and that the second best solution is for Congress to ensure by statute that the seat of government doesn't appoint rogue electors. I read S-51 to accomplish the latter solution by removing any electors that might be appointed for the seat of government from the electoral count. In my written testimony, I offer suggestions for what Congress could do if it wants to improve on that solution, but the existing solution is adequate. 
Professor Mueller reads the statutes differently, but the key point is this. Professor Mueller and I agree that even if his reading were correct, S-51 would be constitutional, and Congress could solve any confusions arising from the 23rd Amendment statutorily. In other words, he and I agree that nothing about the 23rd Amendment makes S-51 unconstitutional. Given my limited time, I will here address just one of Dr. Pilon's arguments, the contention that S-51 would require the consent of the Maryland legislature. The idea is that Maryland gave what's now Washington, D.C. to the United States to be used as the seat of government, not so that one day it could be a state of its own. In my own view, this is the strongest of Dr. Pilon's arguments, and Ranking Member Portman picked up on it in his opening remarks. But there's a difference between giving a gift for a reason and giving a gift by condition. And I'm happy to discuss the distinction further if it's helpful. But in short, if Maryland had ceded land to the United States and specified that the session was valid only so long as the land were used in a certain way, there might be a problem with S-51. But Maryland's session specified no such condition. Washington, D.C. belongs to the United States. Maryland has no greater claim on it than the rest of America does. So I thank the committee for its attention, and I'll be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Primus. Uh, our next uh, witness is Roger Pilon, a Vice President for Legal Affairs at the B. Kennedy Simon Chair of Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. Uh, Mr. Pilon is a policy scholar at the Cato Institute and is the in, uh, and uh, w uh, is the chair of the Constitutional Studies uh, program. Welcome, Mr. Pilon. Uh, please proceed uh, with your opening statement. Thank you. Unable to is my. Uh, Speaker, Chairman Peters, uh, Ranking Member Portman, uh, thank you for inviting me to testify in the D.C. Admissions Office. S-51 raises both constitutional and practical problems. Uh, that's been the conclusion of every Justice Department that's considered related issues since the time of Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Uh, to summarize my written statement here, uh, which is the, the points that I make here are much more uh, fully discussed in the written statement. Uh, I'll simply touch on four issues. Uh, congressional authority, Maryland's consent, practical problems, and most important, 23rd Amendment. Uh, Congress certainly has authority to admit new states to the Union. It's done so 37 times under Article 4, Section 3, either with the consent of the state from which the new state is created or, more often, from federal territory acquired in clear contemplation uh, of creating states from it, like the Northwest Territory. But this isn't a normal admissions case. The District of Columbia is unique. Our first Congress created it not under Article 4, but under Article 1's uh, enclave clause for the express purpose of its becoming the seat of the new government. It's been that for well over 200 years. Given that history, there's a strong presumption by now uh, against this bill's radical change. The framers certainly didn't intend anything like this. Second, Maryland conceded the land for the express purpose of its becoming the seat of the federal government. It didn't do so for the purpose of creating a new state on its border, nor is it likely that it would have done so for that purpose. Contrary to the bill's proponents, Article 4 alone requires Maryland's consent. Third, as a practical matter, this bill strips Congress of its authority over the present district. Congress will then have authority over this tiny enclave around the National Mall, and that raises numerous practical problems. As James Madison explained, the federal government must not be dependent on any one of the states, nor should any state be either dependent or excessively influential on the federal government. This bill fails on each of those counts. Finally, and most important, the 23rd Amendment, granting the district three electoral college votes, would need to be repealed because there will still be residents in this tiny enclave, enclave including the first family, and they'll have outsized influence on presidential elections. Yet their votes can't be taken away by mere statute. It's going to take an amendment. Proponents seem to understand this. Indeed, their bill provides for expedited procedures for repealing the 23rd Amendment. 
but that's a long shot given the ratification hurdles. So the bill also provides for repealing the statute that enables residents to vote. That would extinguish the resident's right to vote, of course. So there's a problem here. And not even the 39 scholars who wrote to Congress recently to support this bill are able to agree about how to resolve it. One camp reads the 23rd Amendment as self-enforcing and therefore as mandating the appointment of electors. The other reads it as requiring enabling legislation. So without that, there's no way for the residents to vote. And that camp seems perfectly happy with that result. But even if the self-enforcement camp prevailed and the district had to appoint electors in such manner as the Congress made direct, as the amendment reads, both camps claim that Congress could re uh, replace the current law. That law orders electors to vote in accordance with the district's popular vote. The scholars believe that Congress could order electors to vote for the ticket that got the most electoral college votes nationwide, for example or for the ticket that won the national popular vote. In other words, the scholars read manner as referring not simply to procedures needed to execute voting, but to legislation allowing Congress to direct electors how to vote. The current statute does that, of course, but the way it does it is perfectly consistent with the whole point of the 23rd Amendment, namely to enable district voters to choose electors pledged to their preferred ticket. Congress certainly can't direct voters how to vote, but neither could Congress direct electors how to vote, except as consistent with the popular vote in the jurisdiction. Otherwise, the amendment would amount to nothing. Yet that's precisely what the scholars' examples come to. Thus, if district voters went overwhelmingly for electors pledged to the Democrat ticket, while in the rest of the country, the Republican ticket got the most electoral college votes or won the national popular vote, the district's voters would effectively count for nothing because the electors they voted for would be required to ignore how they voted. That would surely raise constitutional issues. In short, I don't see how this bill, if enacted, can overcome the constitutional and practical challenge, challenges 22 state attorneys general have promised it's going to face. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pilon. Our final witness is Derek T. Muller, a professor of law at the University of Iowa College of Law. Mr. Muller focuses on election law, federal courts, civil procedure, administrative law, and evidence. His research concentrates on the role of states in the administration of federal elections. Uh, professor Muller, a uh, Welcome to the committee. You may proceed with your opening comments. Thank you, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, members of the committee. I, I appreciate the kind invitation to testify here today. Uh, I'm a professor of law at the University of Iowa College of Law, as mentioned. I teach election law in federal courts. And today I'm here to talk about four points on voting issues relating to the district. These are not abstract questions about statehood. These are practical problems related to S-51 as it presently exists. First. The 23rd Amendment guarantees that the new district would have three electoral votes no matter how few people reside in it. While most of the District of Columbia would become a state, under S-51, the new seat of government would be known as capital, and capital would be entitled to three electoral votes. The boundaries of capital roughly map onto a census tract. That tract had 33 inhabitants in the 2010 census and 58 in the, in the 2019 survey. A tiny group of prospective voters, potentially including the president and family, who happen to reside here now have three electoral votes. Second, S-51 does not adequately address the 23rd Amendment and related voting issues. To start, there is no guarantee of repeal of the 23rd Amendment. The bill simply hopes it will happen. If there is a legal controversy about whether the district could become a state, everyone has an incentive to wait and see the legal process play out. If statehood is unconstitutional, as found by a federal court, I assume district residents would prefer to retain the 23rd Amendment rather than see it repealed. Amending the Constitution is a hard thing to do. It's been done once in the last 50 years. We've had a lull period of amending the Constitution, and we should not simply wish for future events to occur. Additionally, Section 223 of the Act is misleading. 
is entitled Repeal of Law Providing for Participation of Seat of Government in Election of President and Vice President. But in my judgment, this does not repeal the law providing for participation in the presidential election, which is currently codified in the DC Code and would continue to be in force after S-51 was enacted. Instead, it repeals 3 U.S.C. Section 21, a provision enacted to clarify the Electoral Count Act about the timing, transmission, and counting of electoral votes not the district's participation in a presidential election. Finally, Section 221 of the bill may be unconstitutional. It compels states to permit absent capital voters, eligible voters in capital who were previously domiciled in another state to register in their former states and request absentee ballots for federal elections. But states have the broad power of the qualifications of their voters, including reasonable citizenship, age, and residency requirements Congress's power to dictate voter qualifications for those who moved out of a state years ago is deeply contested. If this section is successfully contested in court, a related provision in federal law that entitles tens of thousands of military and overseas voters to access to the ballot may well be in peril. Third, statehood for the District of Columbia should be conditioned on repeal of the 23rd Amendment. An amendment might condition repeal in the event that the district falls below a certain population threshold, if the bulk of the present District of Columbia becomes a state or is retroceded, the 23rd Amendment would simply cease to apply. Fourth, potential alternative statutory solutions present legal and practical problems. None of these solutions that I describe are present in S-51. There's the stuff of conjecture at the moment. If Congress decided not to appoint any electors at all by, say, repealing the relevant provisions of the DC Code, Congress would be derelict in its duty the Supreme Court has repeatedly noted that in the context of elections, the word shall places a duty. The Constitution provides in the 23rd Amendment, the district shall appoint electors. Congress might enact a law in awarding capitals electors to the winner of the Electoral College or to the winner of the national popular vote. But the 23rd Amendment provides that the district shall appoint and Congress may direct the manner. The first clause is the who, the second clause is the how. If Congress chooses a manner to award electors based on what happens in the rest of the United States, it is hard to say that the district has appointed anyone. Selection must occur within a place, not outside it. Awarding capitals electors to the winner of the national popular vote suffers too. How does Congress determine the national popular vote? How does it handle litigation and recounts? Voter eligibility rules vary from state to state. Voting procedures vary. Different candidates appear on the ballot in different states. While some variation in election procedures is inevitable, it may well violate the Equal Protection Clause, and it certainly presents significant practical problems. In one sense, my testimony is modest. It does not weigh in on the merits or constitutionality of statehood. It is addressed simply at the practicalities of S-51, what it would do and what might happen if it were enacted. It only addresses practical voting rights problems, but these problems are serious and vexing that, in my judgment, the present bill is inadequate to address. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reller, for your, for your testimony here today. You know, as we uh, sit here uh, and meet uh, at this hearing in the United States Senate, uh, we are uh, within a, a city outside these grounds that uh, is populated by over 700,000 Americans who simply do not have equal representation or an equal voice uh, in this Congress. Mr. Morial, uh, as president and CEO of the National Urban League, you, you lead an organization that is dedicated to achieving equal rights. Would you explain to this committee how D.C. statehood furthers our democratic promise of uh, equal representation and how ensuring D.C.'s very diverse population has a voice in Congress is, is part of the American civil rights movement? I think you are on mute. Thank you very much, Chairman Peters. It's axiomatic that the right to vote is fundamental to American democracy. Think of what we have here, 700,000 American citizens who comply with our laws, pay federal taxes, participate uh, in our society, uh, are the only who do not have the right to vote in federal elections in a way that counts, and of course, excluding territories. That robs the 
residents of the District of Columbia a voice in many critical decisions. War and peace, uh, taxation, regulation, distribution of proceeds, and I could continue to list it. It is just so basic. We fought as a nation in the 20th century to expand the right to vote, first to women uh, with the passage of the uh, 20th, rather the, the 19th Amendment, to African Americans with the enactment of the Voting Rights Act, which made real the promise of the 14th and 15th Amendments, with the constitutional ban on poll taxes in every single instance. This is one of the last pieces of that, I think, important shift in how we govern this nation. Uh, for us uh, at the National Urban League, nothing is more fundamental than the right to vote. The ability to choose a member of the House who has a vote on the floor of the House, to choose two members of the United States Senate who have a say in all of the important proceedings. I might add that right now, federal judges and Superior Court judges uh, are appointed by the President of the United States and ratified or rather confirmed by the Senate with no voice by the members of the District of Columbia, by the residents of the District of Columbia in any choice. The U.S. Attorney for District Court Judge, for Appellate Court Judge, or even the court that deals with, uh, if you will, the counterpart to state laws in the District of Columbia, the Superior Court, no voice by the residents of the, of the District of Columbia. This is an injustice in all of the legalistic arguments do not address the fundamental basic issue, and that is the right to vote. So I think I speak for the broad civil rights community and for the voting rights community in saying that this is a long, long battle whose time has come. It's time to enact this bill. Thank you. In our country was founded on the principle of no taxation without representation, a key part of uh, the rev that inspired the, the Revolutionary War. But the reality for DC residents is that uh, unlike uh, any other citizen of this country, they pay taxes, federal taxes, without having full representation in, in Congress. In fact, residents of uh, District of Columbia currently pay more than $6.9 billion annually in federal income taxes. That is more than residents in in over 20 states, and it means D.C. residents pay more per return in federal income tax than residents of any other state. Mayor Bowser, under the status quo, in your mind, is it fair that D.C. residents are paying billions of dollars in taxes every year to the federal government and yet have no say in how those taxpayers or how those, uh, that taxpayer money is being spent? It's, it's absolutely unfair, uh, Mr. Chairman, and you laid it out uh, perfectly. It is a question of fairness, and it is a question uh, for us of what we're entitled to uh, as uh, American citizens and taxpayers. Uh, what we have spent uh, many, many years making sure that everybody recognizes is that the residents of the District of Columbia, uh, we pay our own way. Uh, we run our own government. Uh, we are a state, a city, and a county all at once. Uh, and it is very important um, that a, a jurisdiction as well run as ours, uh, a, a jurisdiction that has built uh, its population, its tax base, has built a AAA uh, bond rating on, on Wall Street, uh, have full representation in the Congress, uh, but also that we have full autonomy over our decisions. Well, thank you, Mayor, for, for that re response. Uh, I need uh, to uh, step out and uh, be on the floor of the Senate, uh, uh, and so I'm going to uh, uh, turn over the, uh, the gavel to Senator uh, Carper, uh, but uh, I will now recognize uh, Senator Johnson, 
I know uh, Senator, uh, Ranking Member uh, Portman had to step away. He has yielded uh, his time to you. Senator Johnson, uh, you may proceed with your questions. Thank you, Thank Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we've, we've heard approximately about an hour of testimony opening statements in, in favor of D.C. statehood and about 15 minutes of uh, the counter argument there, which I found quite convincing. Uh, the, the complexities of it, the difficult nature of uh, the Constitution as well as statutes. Um, a number of times we've been talked, we've, I've heard that uh, something just isn't constitutional about this, that there's constitutional rights being violated. And yet the Constitution set up the district specifically. Um, Mr. Pilon, can you talk about what the founders had in mind and why they set the district apart separate from the type of statehood that we have in the rest of the country? I'd be delighted to do so, Senator Johnson. Uh, and the argument can be found in Federalist 43 by James Madison, in which interdependency and the problem that it poses runs throughout the arrangements that were set forth to create a separate District of Columbia such that it wouldn't be, the federal government wouldn't be seated in any one of the particular states. They had experience with that in 1783 under the Articles of Confederation, where the then Continental Congress was meeting in Philadelphia at the time. And they were confronted with a mob that sought to storm the Constitutional Hall and indeed were forced to flee because the local government would not take measures to prevent that mob from doing so. That was clearly on their mind when they drafted the Constitution's enclave clause, which provides for a district uh, no larger than 10 miles square, not 10 square miles. There's a difference between the two. There's obviously a conflict between a central federal government versus the sovereign states. Uh, those individuals that are within the district obviously have a vested interest in a very powerful federal government, correct? Yes. Uh, which is counter to the power vested in the states that the states want to maintain their sovereign power, correct? Yes. Now, from my standpoint, you know, again, we can talk about the constitutionality, we can talk about the complexities uh, with the statutes and how to deal with the 23rd Amendment. To me, this seems like just a naked power grab. Uh, let, let me just, uh, I thought it was interesting, Senator Lieberman talked about that nobody can pre predict you know, how the district would vote. I, I think he can predict quite handily. Uh, you know, he, he cited Alaska and Hawaii as examples that uh, what people thought, how, how they thought they would vote is com completely flipped. But I don't think either, high, either uh, Hawaii or Alaska have these types of voting histories. Uh, in 2020... 92.2% of D.C. votes went to the Democrat candidate. 5.4% went to the Republican candidate. In the last 80 elections, no Republican candidate has gotten more than 10% of the vote. That's over 28 years. And again, I would argue that certainly has something to do with the vested interest of the people here in D.C. who... who, who you know, there's certainly poverty here, but this district is not made of, of, of many dis disadvantaged individuals because the average median income of District Columbia is $92,000. That compares to the average median income nationally of $65,000. 34% of the residents of the District of Columbia that are 25 years or older have some kind of postgraduate or professional degree versus 13% of the rest of the population. So this is, a, this is an elite group of people here. They have a vested interest in the power of the federal government, and I think that is one of the issues that we need to address when we're talking about whether we should grant statehood to the District of Columbia. Uh, Professor Miller, is, would you agree with that, or what would your comments be on that? And I think statehood is a question of representation and a question of the kinds of, of issues that, that, that the members of this committee are debating to determine whether or not 
Uh, it should look like the present form, whether it should look like statehood, whether it should look like retrocession. So it's certainly the kind of thing that should be considered. In the end, people choose to live here as well. Uh, Madam Mayor, I, I can't uh, let this opportunity pass as long as you're here testifying for a committee uh, to just talk about what I consider uh, an important constitutional issue, which is the equal administration of justice. So just a couple questions uh, in terms of how the district has handled people who have uh, rioted in the summer versus uh, people that breached the Capitol. I condemn both uh, equally. But has, have you determined, have you seen any information in terms of uh, insurance claims of how much damage, property damage was done during the, the summer rioting? Do you have a figure on that? Because we, we know nationally uh, those riots close to $2 billion in insurance claims. Well, well, thank you, Senator, uh, for, for your interest in the district. But I, I have to address your question um, first by talking about uh, the residents of D.C., 700,000 people, hardworking individuals uh, who educate their children, start businesses, and work in the district. Uh, it would be incorrect to say that D.C. residents have more of an interest in the federal government um, than other Americans. Okay. We know that okay. we have federal that's, Again, I, that's, not uh, the all that, that's not the question I asked you. Country. So could, could you answer the question? So I, you, you can you can answer the question I asked you? Do you have a, a property damage estimate from the summer riots? Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that you are opposed to riotous behavior, whether it happened okay, well, get, on 16th Street or here. Ma Madam Mayor, could, could, you, could you answer the question? Do you have an estimate of the property damage during the summer riots? I know that we had one night of um, rioting in the district in do, the do summer. You know, do you know, how many, do you know how many people were arrested for the summer riots? Uh, we've had dozens of people arrested over the last year. Are, are, how many are still being detained? I don't know. I don't know the answer to do, that. Do you know whether by using geolocation, did we go and arrest people who participated in the summer riots uh, in their individual states, like we did with the January 6th uh, breachers? Uh, if you're asking about how the Federal Bureau of Investigation operates, you'll have to address those questions to them. I can speak for the Metropolitan Police Department, uh, and we do not permit uh, any riotous behavior, whoever is, is conducting it. Uh, and we have made arrests uh, in both cases, uh, in cases where we had uh, riotous behavior, and that is a specific behavior here uh, at the, on the, on the Congress's grounds uh, and on city streets. Okay, my, my final point is I know the House of Representatives, some members have, have written a letter to you uh, in, inquiring about the conditions in the D.C. jail, which uh, people are being held, basically in the entire population in some form of solitary confinement. Uh, when you respond to their uh, letter, I'd like you to send me the same response. Well, Senator, you are, you are aware that our criminal justice system is also unique in the American system, uh, that we uh, have a, a, our Metropolitan Police Department makes arrests, but all arrestees are processed through a federal system, through the courts who have federally appointed judges, uh, pretrial system that is federal, federal uh, as, as well. We operate a D.C. jail, uh, and if there are any concerns about uh, conditions at the jail, I will address them. There are, and again, I'm just asking you to respond to me when you respond to the House uh, members who are asking about the conditions of solitary confinement. Yes. You would. And, and having control of our criminal justice system is a driving force behind uh, why we need statehood. Uh, certainly, we've talked about representation, but being able to enforce our own laws uh, is important to how uh, we operate uh, our jurisdiction. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank God. Uh, thank you, Senator Johnson. Just uh, to our witnesses, let me just note that uh, the members of the committee will have the uh, the opportunity and the right to submit questions for the record. And uh, if they exercise that uh, that right, then we just appreciate very much your your timely uh, timely response. I, um, I again, we thank uh, all of you for joining us to uh, today and, and uh, to testify and present your your points of view. And I'm going to uh, uh, ask if I can uh, for. Uh, Dr. Uh, Primus, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Primus, I'd like for you to just reflect on uh, what uh, we have heard today, 
from uh, uh, Dr. Pylon and from uh, Mr. Uh, Muller. And to, to ask, is, is there anything uh, that you've heard from either of uh, these witnesses? Anything you'd like to just to comment on, please? Thanks. Sure, and uh, it's a privilege to share the hearing with both of them. They're both people who think a lot about these issues. Um, the first thing I would note is that there's something a little bit curious about the contention that we've heard um, from uh, Professor Muller that we shouldn't count on the ability to repeal the 23rd Amendment. It's true that repeal doesn't happen by itself, but here's what I just want to point out to the committee in a very, very big picture way. Um, many members of the United States Senate are committed to a theory of constitutional interpretation that usually goes by the name of originalism. It's the theory that's usually associated with the late Justice Scalia. And one of its very basic premises is that the Constitution's original meanings are binding because if we don't like what it means, we can just change it. That is, the whole theory is premised on the idea that the Constitution can be amended whenever we the people want. To take the view that the 23rd Amendment couldn't be amended, that it's very unrealistic to think that would happen, even though the 23rd Amendment would be ultimately pointless, nobody would really want it around if S51 were to be adopted, is essentially to say that the theory of originalism associated with Justice Scalia is all wrong, is a fable. And I don't think that's a position that um, everyone who is a member of the U.S. Senate wants to endorse. Um, I should also say briefly about uh, one of Dr. Pilon's points. Um, I'm sorry? Thank you. I just was uh, uh, listening to something that my co colleague, Mr. Oh. Senator Johnson, said. Go ahead. Anything else um, you want to say on this point? I'll just say very briefly, Dr. Um, Dr. Pilon says that there's disagreement among the scholars who wrote in to support the constitutionality of this bill about the best way to solve the complications arising from the 23rd Amendment. It's true there is disagreement about what the best way to solve the problem is. That's because there are many possible solutions. And as among many adequate possible solutions, not, not everyone agrees on what the best solution is, but everyone agrees that the problems are solvable. Um, Professor Muller agrees about this. I agree uh, with this also. Um, I could, if the committee wanted to, speak about specific details of complexities that are raised and why there are actually not problems or solvable, but we all agree that all of these problems are solvable and none of them should be an obstacle to S51. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Primes, thank you very much for, for that response. As you mentioned um, in your testimony, uh, some people believe that uh, the District of Columbia can only become a state through a constitutional amendment. Uh, my bill, a bill that uh, m many of our colleagues have co-sponsored, as well as the nearly 40 constitutional law experts who recently signed a letter of support uh, believe otherwise. Uh, Professor Primus, I'm going to ask you a series of uh, bre uh, brief questions, if um, if you don't mind. The first of those was, how many of the 37 states admitted to the Union after the original 13 colonies were done so by a constitutional amendment? None. Second, did uh, Congress require a constitutional amendment to shrink the capital in 1846 when it gave land back to Virginia? No, it did not. Third, what is the maximum size of the seat of government established in the Constitution, and does it require a minimum size? Well, the maximum is 10 miles square. That's the plain text. There is no minimum size. It's left to the judgment of Congress. Thank you. And lastly, can you speak briefly as to why a constitutional amendment is not required, nor the norm? Well, constitution and a wait, constitutional wait, 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 wait. Can you speak uh, briefly uh, as to why a constitutional amendment is not required, nor the norm, in entering a state into the Union, and how the Constitution grants Congress the authority to make a state? Go right ahead. Sure. Well, this is just the text of the Constitution. The Constitution, Article 4, Section 3, contains the Admissions Clause, which says that Congress can admit new states into the Union. Like every other power expressly vested in Congress by the Constitution, except where specifically specified otherwise, 
that power is accomplished by congressional action by a majority of each house and then presentment to the president. Um, in the small number of cases where something has to be done differently, the Constitution specifies that it has to be done differently. And this isn't just an oversight. Um, at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, there was a proposal considered to require a, a supermajority of Congress to consent to the admission of new states, and it was rejected. It was felt that this is the sort of thing that Congress can do all by itself in the normal way that it does everything else. That's just the text of the Constitution. Um, to say that it has to be done in some other way is simply to say something that the Constitution doesn't say. Um, uh, if I might say one other thing, um, uh, the, the suggestion that Congress needs Maryland's permission is not supported by the clause. Um, it's true that Maryland gave the land to the United States to be used as the district. Um, but the land was used as the district. Um, suppose you wanted to bike to work instead of to drive. And I said, I have an extra bike. Why don't you just take my bike here? It's present. And for 10 years, you use my bike and you know, ride it every day. And then 10 years later, you decide that you want to do something else with the bike. You're going to ride it on weekends or you're going to give it to your kid or some such thing. Um, you don't need to come back and ask me to do that. I gave you the bike. And I, I didn't say, if you do something with it, otherwise one day you have to give it back to me. That's the position we're in. Um, the DC belongs to the United States. Thank you for that, uh, that response. We've been joined by S Senator Langford. I'm pleased to recognize him at this time. Thank you for joining us, James. Senator Carper, thank you very much. I know you've been in this dialogue for a very long time and uh, that you've been engaged in this as many of you have been engaged for a very long time on this. Uh, you also know my predecessor uh, in the last time that there was a hearing on this, uh, Senator Coburn, uh, when he came in uh, to this hearing, sat down, said there's a waste of time and walked out. And uh, I know y'all had- A man of few words. Yes. <laughs> I know that uh, y'all had multiple conversations on things you could agree on. I know this was also an area that you had, you had strong disagreement. We had a great friendship. He was a good talker. I was a good listener. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the dialogue on this and uh, to be able to go through it. Obviously, this has been a point of conversation uh, for many people for a very long time uh, to be able to talk about this. I want to begin with a larger question on this, and that is the issue of retrocession. Obviously, we've walked through this uh, area before as a nation, uh, that the southern port of the district of uh, southern portion of the District of Columbia uh, retroceded back to Virginia in 1846. I think just about everybody on the panel has mentioned that so far today uh, to be able to discuss retrocession. What is the barrier to retrocession with Maryland today? Spelling. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Langford. Um, that issue with respect to the retrocession of Virginia in 1847-46 has never been tested. It arose in a private taxpayer suit in thir some 30 years later. Uh, the court declined to address the merits because so much uh, water had gone under the bridge and so much would have to be disturbed. Um, many people have questioned whether that retrocession was legitimate, including no less than President Lincoln and President Taft and others. And so it remains an open question. So there, what is the way that that would have to be resolved? Well, the court would have to speak to it, first of all. Well, you'd have to find someone with standing, first of all, to, for the court to speak to it. Yeah, there would, there would, the standing issue would certainly come up. But with respect to retrocession to, of, uh, to Maryland, which is what your opening right. question was about, there you would certainly need the consent of Maryland to do that. In fact, if I may uh, respond to a point that Professor uh, Primus uh, raid, uh, made, um, the, the, the grant of land from Maryland uh, to the district was made pursuant to Article of uh, uh, for Article One, uh, the Enclave Clause, uh, for the specific, expressly for the specific purpose of creating a seat for the new government. Now, suppose he used a hypothetical. I'll give you a hypothetical. Suppose that uh, immediately upon receiving that land, 
uh, the uh, the um, federal government turned around and created a state rather than the seat of the new government. Everybody would agree that was sheer political mischief. Well, if that's the case, then what difference does it make whether they did it immediately or in the interview in even of 200 years? The principle remains the same. They did not use it for the purposes for which the land was granted, but to do, to do something completely different. And that raises a serious problem in and of itself. And it raises the Article 4 question, too, because in order for the federal government, Congress, to make a state out of the district, you would need, had they done that initially, the consent of Maryland to do that under Article 4. It seems to me that consent will still be needed, even though it's more than 200 years later. It, it is interesting. When I look back on the history of this conversation. Again, none of this is new in this dialogue. In um, 1963, uh, at that time, Attorney General Robert Kennedy wrote, while Congress's power to legislate for the district is a continuing power, its power to create the district by acceptance of secession contemplates a single act. The Constitution makes no provision for revocation and the act of acceptance or for retrocession. Uh, and then uh, Ed Meese, uh, then a couple of decades later, and uh, as our Attorney General in 1987, wrote, clearly the district chosen would not exceed 10 miles square, but under the language of that clause, once the session was made and this district became the seat of government, the authority of Congress over its size and location seems to have been exhausted. The Constitution appears to leave Congress no authority to redefine the district's boundaries, absent an amendment granting it that power. Now, obviously, constitutional scholars, even at this conversation, have disagreed with that. What is your thoughts? Well, uh, Attorney General Kennedy was absolutely right. The, re the creation of the district was a single act. It was completed. It was done. Now you've got to look where Congress might have other authority to, uh, to turn that uh, district into something like a new state. The other side points to the fourth, uh, to Article 4. The problem there is that the district is sui generis. It's unique. This is not a normal creation of a state process as though you were doing it under Article 4 with the federal territory, say the Northwest Territory, the Louisiana Purchase, land that was acquired in clear contemplation of new states being created for it. The District of Columbia was not created with the contemplation of a new state being created from it. Okay. Mayor Bowser, it's good to see you again. Uh, we've had the opportunity to be able to chat for several years now, so it's good to see you again. L let me ask you a, a couple of questions on this as well. Uh, were you surprised at the original design of the, uh, the transition of leadership that the mayor, whoever the mayor is at whatever time that this would be, would automatically become governor in that transition. Obviously, the federal officials would have to go under an election, but state, <clears throat> I'm sorry, at that point, uh, district leadership would become state leadership and be an automatic transition. Is that surprising to you just in the structure of it? We, uh, uh, we convened a constitutional convention, Senator, uh, so over several months, uh, D.C. residents participated in how they would want the state government to look, and we wrote a constitution. Uh, in that constitution, uh, we uh, expanded democracy by adding more state legislatures, which is, was a, is important, uh, but also uh, just converted the, the existing elected officials uh, to seats. Um, and the Constitution also contemplates the election of the new state representatives uh, and the federal officials. Let me follow through on, on one more issue that is is connected but not connected on this. Uh, Washington, D.C., during the pandemic time period, had the most strict uh, religious liberty restrictions of all across the United States, uh, with the limitations for gathering of people of faith to be able to gather indoors. Uh, there was a lot of pushback that happened. You, you eventually changed that and opened that up a little bit, uh, but it was, it was still a very, very strict um, non-allowance, I guess I should say, for people of faith to be able to meet, whether it was last Easter or other times to be able to gather and to be able to go through all these. They're just their normal faith gathering time period. Uh, you have to know that uh, Congress overwhelmingly passed in 1993 
the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And it's interesting to me during this time period in this conversation, uh, Delegate Norton uh, introduced uh, H.R. 4023, which would amend the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and would take out the applicability of that to Washington, D.C., that Washington, D.C. would no longer fall under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as the rest of America would. And, and watching what happened for the limitation of people of faith during the time of the pandemic. I'm trying to figure out if this became a new state, kind of the direction that this seems to be headed for people of faith to be able to live out their faith. Now, I have no belief that you're trying to limit people from having faith in D.C., but it was odd during this season of the pandemic to see such strong limits on people of faith gathering together. Can you help me understand that? Well, certainly. Um, the limits were, you know, the COVID restrictions were for everybody. Um, and I, I don't have to tell you that we faced a 100-year pandemic. Right. Uh, and I am very proud of D.C. residents, businesses, houses of worship uh, who followed health guidance and allowed us to crush this virus. That's why I can sit here today with D.C. fully open. Uh, and I know that we save lives um, by flattening the curve, keeping people out of the hospital and intensive cares, uh, and uh, making sure our first responders could respond to the virus. So I'm proud of the work um, that we did. Uh, certainly, uh, what health guidance told us, senators, uh, were that some indoor spaces were uh, more of a risk for transmission of the virus than others. Uh, and unfortunately, churches were among them. Uh, and I believe me, I've had this debate. I've had this debate with my own church in court. Uh, and we have come to, uh, we came to many compromises. It was always our intent uh, to make sure that uh, people of faith and houses of worship all across the district could practice their faith, but also practice it safely. I don't have to remind you, our very first case uh, in the district uh, was in a church. Uh, and we saw uh, the spread of the virus, and we learned a lot about the spread of the virus from case number one. Uh, so the work that we did was important. It was necessary. Uh, and the compromises that we made were also good ones. It, it is a uh, it is an interesting balance though, to be able to walk through First Amendment protections and also pandemic protections yep. in this process. And as you know, many churches left the district to be able to go worship a few miles away, either in Maryland or in Virginia, where they could meet for worship to be able to gather indoors or outdoors. And uh, I understand as a mayor, you make difficult calls, um, but there is a unique protection for people of faith to be able to live out their faith and be able to guard that. So I appreciate the dialogue. Sure. And uh, let me yield back to Tom. I apologize for going a little bit long. No, 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 no. Happy, happy you're here. Thank you for, for your questions. You know, it'd be interesting to know, I, uh, Senator Lank was pro probably, uh, as I mentioned, none of a uh, number of, of members of our uh, body here are uh, people of deep faith, none deeper than his. And it'd be interesting to to know, um, you know, worship uh, attendance at worship services of all different faiths ebbs and flows over time, and we're seeing some ebbing going along in most uh, uh, major faiths in in this country today. It'd be interesting to, uh, and I don't, and I don't presume to believe that anybody knows what this number would be. But it's interesting to know what the church attendance is like in the district, as maybe is compared to some of our other states. That'd be an interesting. We're not, maybe I'll ask that question for for, for the record. It'd be interesting to, to see what that looks like. Um, I have a, a, a follow-on question, if I could, for uh, for, uh, and I'd ask the, the mayor if you could uh, handle this. But I also want to ask Mr. Moriel. Uh, to join as as well, so I'll ask the you, two of you to tag team. But I, I never imagined, as an elected official, as a Delaware's treasurer, congressman, governor, senator, uh, then retired Navy captain, Vietnam veteran, last Vietnam veteran serving here. But I never imagined serving uh, when I was serving in all those capacities that I would ever end up leading a charge in uh, the Senate uh, to uh, to fight on behalf of the residents of um, the 51st state. Uh, but that's where we find ourselves, and I think we regularly see the the uh, the negative effects of these on DC uh, um, residents of not having a vote or a voice in Congress. We've talked about that, especially during a global uh, pandemic. As a district with 46% African American population, let's not forget that, uh, like other communities of color across the nation, African Americans are suffering disproportionately in or have suffered disproportionately in D.C. from the COVID-19 pandemic. And most of those infected in D.C. are people of color, as you know. 
And uh, I'm told that about 75% of those who've died here are African American. And uh, I would ask uh, a mayor and then Mr. Muriel, um, can you speak on uh, to the, the issue of uh, inequality here? And uh, Mayor Bowser, could I uh, please ask you to speak to why the nearly 700,000 district residents, our fellow Americans have been and continue to be disproportionately impacted during the pandemic as a result of not being a state? Well, thank you, uh, Senator. And uh, you're, uh, I think you're just about right about those uh, stats. Uh, we saw early on in the pandemic uh, that our uh, African-American residents were not only um, being infected with COVID-19, but dying from COVID-19 uh, in, in vastly greater numbers uh, than their white counterparts. Uh, we know uh, that African Americans and our Latino residents are more likely to be in uh, essential work positions and were, were unable to stay at home when stay at home or orders were uh, introduced across America because they were um, the grocery workers. They were the nursing assistants. Uh, they were uh, the, the people that were keeping our sanitation um, services uh, going across America. So they were um, getting infected more. Uh, and because of centuries of disinvestment in uh, our health, uh, we're also uh, dying more. Uh, what was a tragedy that we didn't expect during all of this as we're facing a 100-year pandemic is that we would be left out of the emergency funding that we so desperately needed uh, to stand up testing, uh, to build alternative care sites, uh, to make sure that we could provide alternate spaces uh, for learning by in the CARES Act. $755 million uh, we were shortchanged, and we spent the better part of the year uh, making sure we got that money back. And I'm grateful uh, to this Congress for seeing, seeing that through. Uh, but what that meant, uh, Senator, for the first time in, in, in no one could remember since, uh, that we were treated um, in a... In a um, a formula with territories um, rather than being treated uh, like a state, which we are for hundreds of federal, uh, in hundreds of federal statutes. Uh, so it was, it just made clear to all of us how important it was that our, what our practical operation as a state, a county, and a city um, can only be codified and not, um, reversed in any piece of legislation with statehood. All right. Thank you for that response. Uh, Mr. Morial, would you like to add to uh, that, uh, those words? Let me uh, say, Senator Carver, appreciate you uh, raising this issue. A few important facts. The United States is approximately 14% uh, African American. The District of Columbia is some 46 to 50 percent African American. The failure to provide federal voting rights, voting rights for a member of Congress and two U.S. Senators for the 51st state disproportionately impacts a large number of African American citizens of the United States. There's once a time when the District of Columbia was as much as 70% African American. And DC became, uh, in the early 20th century, a place where African American residents of Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, and the Old South as a part of the Great Migration transition to. They had no right to vote in Alabama, or Georgia, or South Carolina, or North Carolina, or Virginia, and they had no right to vote in the District of Columbia. Then the Voting Rights Act came along, and people in Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Louisiana, Texas, and Florida gained the right to vote for members of the House and members of the United States Senate. But the members of the District of Columbia, the Black residents, and beyond the black residents were left out and left behind. Mayor Bowser identified the structural 
impact of this is that DC for many federal programs and initiatives is treated like a territory, which denies the residents of the District of Columbia, including its black residents, equal treatment and therefore equal representation, not only in voting, but across the board. And that's a structural inequity that's associated with this fundamental denial of the right to vote. One only believes, as I do, that the residents of the District of Columbia have been patient since 1965, have been patient as they sought to achieve and to accomplish their full rights as American citizens. And I doubt if anyone else outside of the District of Columbia would stand for being disenfranchised in the way the residents of the District of Columbia have been disenfranchised. This, this is something whose time has come, and this is something that is of right. Thank you for those words. That was, that was uh, I thought very insightful. Thank you. I've been joined by Senator Rosen. I want to thank you for joining us today, for being a supporter of this legislation, and uh, you're now recognized. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Rosen. Well, uh, thank you, Senator Carper. Appreciate your work on this for uh, many years and your chairmanship of this committee in the past. Um, I, I really like to thank Mayor Bowser, Congresswoman Holmes Norton, uh, well, Senator Lieberman has left, but everyone for being here and for the work um, that you've been doing, because we know there's a lot of contributions from our DC residents. I, I like to say every senator is a parent of an only child, the states we represent, and we're so incredibly proud of them, right? We're the, their biggest cheerleader, their biggest champion. And so for me, that means Nevada, and I couldn't be prouder of our great state and its amazing people, but we weren't always a state. We began as a territory, becoming part of the United States, but not yet a full state. Via treaty with Mexico in 1848, that's when we were a territory. In the beginning, we didn't even have our name. We were part of the Utah Territory, becoming the Nevada Territory only in 1861, and it wasn't until October 31st, uh, Nevada Day, we call it now, 1864, in the midst of the Civil War, just eight days before President Lincoln's reelection, that Nevada, the battle-born state, became the 36th state in the Union. I'm a co uh, proud co-sponsor of S51, the bill that provides statehood to DC, and so I am so glad uh, to hear your story and have that become part of your state story when somebody tells that yeah. in the future. And so um, we just want you to be the parents of the newest state. So Mayor Bowser, as a proud D.C. resident, as its elected chief executive, can you tell us about some of the wonderful contributions that D.C. residents make to our, not just this community, but to our country every day? Well, thank you for that question, Senator, and thank you for sharing the Nevada story. And we do indeed um, look forward to, to telling uh, the D.C. story and being admitted just like Nevada was by a simple uh, legislation um, by this Congress who has that, that full authority. Uh, when we think about D.C. residents, we're, we're eight wards, 700,000 people, uh, people who start businesses here, uh, who raise their children here and pay their taxes. In fact, they pay um, more taxes per capita um, than, than any other American, and we pay more taxes than, than 20 states. Uh, we are a uh, what we call a donor state to the federal government, uh, and sometimes people are mistaken and think that the federal government pays to operate the District of Columbia, and that's just not the case. Uh, I presented just a couple of weeks ago a $17 billion budget uh, to the Council of the District of Columbia, which will become our state legislature. Uh, and unlike um, other mayors, uh, we operate a school system. We operate our correction system, our Department of Motor Vehicles. So in so many ways, we already function uh, as a state. You're the busiest mayor, is that what you're saying? <laughs> but you are the most diverse mayor, perhaps, because diversity is a strength, that's for sure. And uh, like D.C., Nevada's population, I'll tell you about our state, incredibly diverse, our strength as well. We have 30% Latino, 10% African American, about 9.5% AAPI community. In fact, we have the fastest growing AAPI community, one of them in the nation. 
And while D.C. is often called out for having lots of newcomers, Nevada has uh, many new residents as well, as well, and sometimes we've been known to be the fastest growing state uh, um, in the country. And so uh, only 25% of Nevada's 3 million residents were actually born in Nevada. So our diverse population, the influx of people from all around the nation and the world uh, that make us the dynamic state that we are. So I know you too have a diverse population, comes from all over the country and all over the world. And why does it matter to this population as well that they're the 51st state? Well, absolutely. We are uh, diverse, and we're diverse in some ways that people don't recognize. Uh, we are as uh, as I call him Mayor Moriel, but President Moriel also, also mentioned 46% African American, 12% Latino, about 3 or 4% AAPI, uh, and we're also growing with our recent census. We're among the fastest growing jurisdictions in the nation as well. Uh, let me say something about our economic diversity. Uh, and frequently, we th we're thought of as a federal government town. Um, and indeed, we're proud to be host to the federal government, um, but, the, but the federal government's presence in the District of Columbia has actually been decreasing over, over many, over a couple of decades. Uh, and so federal jobs have been decreasing, federal workers have been decreasing, and even the federal use of space uh, uh, in the district uh, has been decreasing over several years. So we've been focused on how to diversify our economy, build private sector jobs, focus on technology and hospitality and education. Um, those are the jobs of the future in the district. Uh, and that's why uh, our economy has been so robust. Uh, it was discussed earlier that we're a, a elite place. Um, speaking as a, the daughter of two government workers who raised five kids, it focused on family and faith uh, in this city, I can tell you um, that people work hard here. Uh, but we also have a diversity of incomes and even a diversity uh, of views. Uh, so we are particularly well situated right now, Senator, to be admitted as a state. Uh, you'll see with our population, uh, we're larger uh, than two states already, and we rival five others, and the way that we're growing, we'll achieve that. Uh, we're by far larger than most states um, when they were admitted uh, to the union. Uh, so we are, we are just poised. Um, to be a great benefit uh, to the union as the 51st state. Well, thank you. I think you're a great benefit already. Thank Appreciate you. your service. And I will um, yield back my time. Thanks. Thanks for, uh, very much for yielding. Senator Lankford, if you'd like to recognize again, I'm happy to do that. Senator Carper, thank you very much sure. for that. Professor Miller, look, I want to ask you a couple of questions to be able to follow up on some of your statements earlier. You had talked about the difference in this bill uh, the H.R. 51 bill and the way that it handles the 23rd Amendment. Uh, this bill says that uh, we'll pass it, we'll declare D.C. a state, and then we'll get around to doing the 23rd Amendment to be able to change the electors issue that's hanging out there. You flipped that in your earlier statement in saying, why wouldn't this be conditioned on the 23rd Amendment being eliminated first to be able to make sure that there's not three additional electoral college? I think uh, you mentioned for 59 people uh, that would be in the new capital enclave at that point, uh, that those 59 people wouldn't have three electoral college votes. Can you go into that a little deeper? Sure. So the, the bill does anticipate an expedited repeal process. It could only do one thing, which is an article that says we repeal the 23rd Amendment. Um, but, you know, until that happens, we have an enclave of around 59 people, some subset of that voters, who would then be eligible to choose three presidential electors. And so the, the thought is, well, if we can push people and hopefully wait and see what happens, and maybe the 23rd Amendment will be repealed. Um, so there's no condition on that. There's no sort of uh, hard rule. The, the hard rule is that Congress has to have a vote. There's no guarantee that two-thirds of each House of Congress does it. There's not going to be a time limit about when 38 or 39 states approve that amendment. So it's sort of waiting to see what will happen while the 23rd Amendment giving three electoral votes to this enclave sits there. So instead, another way might be to say, let's repeal the 23rd Amendment or put a condition in the 23rd Amendment saying, if the population of the district constituting the seat of government drops below a certain population threshold, 
then the 23rd article uh, of the Constitution is no longer in place, 23rd article of amendment uh, no longer applies. And then that way we don't have these sorts of residual problems out there. Right, do you know of any issue with trying to be able to form that, um, that way, uh, what you're describing as far as a constitutional issue or a problem with that? No, I, mean, I think you, you could develop a constitutional amendment that would condition the repeal of the 23rd Amendment on some future event, like retrocession or statehood for the district. You could also, you know, I mentioned in my testimony some of the concerns about how to handle the capital voters left within that enclave. I think it's contested whether or not Congress has that power. I think a constitutional amendment that empowers Congress expressly to handle those voters left in the Capitol. You could certainly fashion amendments and think creatively about how to address that solution holistically on a constitutional side before you get to the statutory side. Right, but either way, there's a tremendous number of constitutional issues that still have to be resolved. I, I, yeah. Obviously, the founders designed a capital region to never be a state. I mean, that was the design in the Constitution to say, this is uniquely so that the federal government does not exist within the, under the authority of any state or trying to interact with the state. It was designed very particularly to be able to make sure that constitutionally there would always be a region that is there uh, that was established so the federal government didn't have to worry about what, what's, what's state, what's federal, and living under that. So there are lots of constitutional questions here that the farther you go, the larger the constitutional questions get. Many of them are novel. Uh, they've never been addressed before. Uh, obviously, the retrocession to Virginia of the southern portion of D.C. Uh, was never, uh, southern portion of D.C. was never really resolved long term. Uh, that was still hangs out there, but all the other constitutional issues still are reserved. Is that correct or not correct? R right. There are a number of, of unsettled constitutional issues. You've heard about some of them today, and they've been written about for, for decades. Right. 200 plus years, any individual that moves to Washington, D.C. understands that Washington, D.C. is unique. This is a place where you don't have a vote for a senator or a House member. Uh, of late, of the last 100 years, we've had a delegate uh, in the House. Uh, but it's been well known that when you move to Washington, D.C. at any point, you're moving to an area that doesn't have a two senators or a House member, correct or not correct? Yes, that's correct. So I, when, when, I, when I look at it and just the transition of this, that, that is a given statement uh, for anyone that's moving. Um, my, my hometown of Oklahoma City um, is 10 times the size of Washington, D.C. But there are still individuals that want to live in Edmond or in Norman or in Moore or in Bethany, and they choose to be able to move out of Oklahoma City but still commute back and forth in other areas to be able to work or live because it's a choice that they make. Uh, in an area that is literally one-tenth of the size of my hometown of Oklahoma City, people have options to be able to still work and to be able to travel and to be able to move into other areas. If they wanted to be able to work in Washington, D.C., many people live in Maryland or in Virginia or in West Virginia and drive in uh, to be able to be here from longer distances. Uh, but that's a volitional choice. No one's compelled to actually be here, knowing that that's been the situation for more than 200 years, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Langford. Uh, Chair recognizes Senator Hawley for your question. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to all the witnesses uh, for being here. Uh, Dr. Pinelon, let me just start with you, if I could. Um, just help me understand the history here. My understanding is that the United States Justice Department, the Office of Legal Counsel, has weighed in on this question a number of times over the course of its history. To my knowledge, the Office of Legal Counsel has never said that Congress has the ability by statute to turn the District of Columbia into a state. Is that correct? That is correct. The only exception occurred during the Obama administration when the Office of Legal Counsel okay. gave the no-go for this. And so he turned to the Solicitor General's office, and the Solicitor General said, we can defend this. And, of course, that's very precious yeah. because that's the job of the Solicitor General's office to defend even unconstitutional matters that may turn out yeah, to be such. Sure. So the, the, what happened was the Attorney General under that administration got a consistent answer, the same answer that Attorneys General had been getting and Presidents had been getting for decades, decided he didn't like that answer and said, well, maybe, maybe somebody else will give me a different answer. But consistently, the Office of Legal Counsel, which is that unit in the Justice Department, that office that is charged with looking at these constitutional questions and providing dispassionate impartial, nonpartisan legal counsel has consistently said there's no constitutional authority for Congress to snap its fingers, use a statute 
to turn D.C. into a state. Right. Now, tell me about this. Is, of course, that's a bipartisan tradition. You mentioned in your written testimony one pretty prominent Democrat attorney general, Robert Kennedy. He rendered a fairly lengthy opinion on this. Tell us about the significance of Robert Kennedy's opinion uh, back in 1963, I think it was, when he said that, no, th th the Constitution does not give Congress the power by statute to turn D.C. into a state. Of course, it can be done by constitutional amendment. Uh, how exactly it would have to be worked out, but that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about just doing it by statute. Even Robert Kennedy said, no, that can't be done. Tell us about the significance of his opinion. Well, the significance beyond the fact that he was a Democrat comes from the fact that he said that this is a single act, the creation of the district. Then the question becomes, does Congress have authority to do what is contemplated by these various proposals that have come over the years. And the conclusion that the Office of Legal Counsel gave him was that no, they do not. It is a single act to create the district. It is finished. If you want to do something more like retrocession and so forth, you're going to need to find some authority under the Constitution. And the important issue here was just brought up by a, a Senator Lankford, namely that the district is unique. It's not an ordinary process of creating a new state from territory acquired for the express purpose of creating new states from it, the Louisiana Purchase, et cetera. It is sui generis. It was created expressly under Article I, not under Article IV, to be the seat of the federal government. Under this bill, S-51, the seat of the government would be this tiny enclave and I just invite you to think, uh, in response to an earlier question from Senator Lankford, what this would mean with this much reduced authority of Congress to have exclusive jurisdiction over this tiny enclave. It means that, for example, they are dependent upon this new untested state for everything from power to water to fire protection, right. uh, and, and going on and on. Uh, we can imagine how the framers did not want that, and they didn't want it expressly because of what the experience, as we testified earlier, they had under 1783 when the Congress was attacked by a mob. Let, well, let me ask you this. So just... So we have, the, we have the scene set. The Constitution of the United States expressly and explicitly creates the District of Columbia. It designates it as the seat of government. We have the 23rd Amendment, which comes along and, and ratifies that, essentially. I mean, it's already in the Constitution. The 23rd Amendment ratifies that, so that it, it is there. It's not an unincorporated territory. It is created by the Constitution, created as the seat of government. Now, my understanding of constitutional law is Congress cannot, by legislation, override the Constitution. Am I right about that, basic understanding? That's uh, Con Law 101. Now, what if Congress really, really wants to? Like, what if Congress thinks, no, it's really, really important that we override the Constitution? Do they, do they get to do it then? That's called the demise of the rule of law. What happens if it's a really, it, it, there's a great political advantage to one party if they do it? I'm looking here at a series of news articles from the last year and a half. The Nation. Democrats have inherited a broken Senate. Can they make it work? It calls for D.C. statehood to add two more Democrat votes to the Senate. NBC News, new push for Washington, D.C. statehood hits the presidential campaign trail. Imperative, Democrats say, to add two more votes to the United States Senate for them. New York Magazine, D.C. statehood is the Democrats' only option. Vox, 11 ways to fix America's fundamentally broken democracy. D.C. statehood to add two more Democrat votes to the United States Senate. Indivisible says making democracy reform a priority has to be D.C. statehood. All of this, the premise of all of these articles, which are very candid, is that Democrats think that they won't be able to control the United States Senate in the long term. They need to add two more Democrat seats to control the Senate. So it's really, really important. If they think it's really, really important, does the Constitution give them the authority to override what is actually written down in that text with a law? Can they do that? Let me get on the record an important point. It, it is often thought that we on this side are opposed to giving the district residents the vote. Nothing could be further from the truth. The idea is, however, that you must do it in the right way. You've got to do it in the constitutional way. And so 
That means that you're going to have to address, among other things, the 23rd Amendment problem, because there will still be people within this district who still have the right to vote. You can't remove that from them by mere statute. It's got to have an amendment to do that. And indeed, if the table were, were, tables were reversed on some other issue, I think the other side would be screaming if this were attempted. And rightfully so. And I'll just finish, Mr. Chairman, by saying that it is a fundamental premise of our democracy that the Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land, that it binds all who live under it. And we, the people, can change it. We absolutely can change it. We have a process to do that, a democratic process. What Congress cannot do is override the Constitution anytime it becomes inconvenient for a majority in Congress, a temporary majority, as James Madison would have said. Today it's the Democrats, tomorrow it's the Republicans, after that the Democrats again, who knows? The point is the Constitution endures, and that is the fundamental premise of our democratic republic, and I fear that that, that premise is being threatened by this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Sen Thank you, Senator Hawley. I want to follow up on uh, uh, Mr. Pylon's uh, comments on the 23rd Amendment. So those questions for you, uh, Mayor Bowser. Uh, in, in your written testimony, uh, you state that it is, uh, quote, uh, it's particularly contradictory that the 23rd Amendment is being held up as the main barrier to further expanding constitutional rights in the district. Could you elaborate on this point for the committee, please? Well, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, and let, let me be clear what the 23rd Amendment does. Uh, the 23rd Amendment allowed D.C. residents a vote for president, uh, and that was in the 1960s. Uh, so let just let that marinate for a second. Uh, before the 1960s, this is just you know, just about 10 years before I was born, uh, we couldn't even vote for president. We couldn't even vote for president. So that's what the 23rd Amendment does. Its intent was to expand democracy to D.C. residents. And now it's being held up as a barrier. I just ask you to, to look at the comments that were submitted by 39 legal scholars what Professor Primus has already te Primus has testified to today, uh, that this th the 23rd Amendment poses no constitutional barrier to this bill's passage. D.C. can be admitted as a state. The practical concerns uh, have been have been discussed, uh, and this bill also lays out practical solutions uh, by repealing um, the enforcement legislation. The 23rd Amendment makes clear that Congress, it is the Congress by statute, can enforce the 23rd Amendment, must enforce the 23rd Amendment. Uh, and that is what uh, will happen uh, after this bill is passed. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Uh, Morial. I want to ask you a question related to the 23rd Amendment as well. And you've heard the mayor speak, and you've heard uh, critics say that uh, the 23rd Amendment really provides sufficient uh, voting rights now um, because you can vote for president. That, that's, that's part of it. Could you, Mr. Morial, would you, would you explain the importance of granting full voting rights and equal representation and how important that is in your mind? Every American citizen has the right those that live in the states of the United States, the right to elect people to the legislative branch and the executive branch and therefore have a voice in the selection of the judicial branch. To suggest that for the residents of the District of Columbia, that solely having a right to participate in the presidential election, it's tantamount to the one third rule We'll give you one third of your federal voting rights and the other two third, we're gonna withhold. This is really, I've listened today to a lot of arguments about the constitution and about the law and I'm a lawyer and respect those. But when you balance what is fundamental to the United States, all of our rights as citizens, it is the right to vote which is fundamental. When the 23rd Amendment was passed, black DC residents did not have the protection of the Voting Rights Act. 
poll tax was legal. These are different times. And I think that all of these arguments fall by the wayside when you balance it against the necessity. What does a vote in Congress give you an opportunity to do? Participate in the appropriations process. Participate in the process of writing laws. Giving yourselves a voice on taxation issues, on regulatory issues, on a wide range of issues. The District of Columbia is a dynamic community of 700,000 people. It's distinct from the state of Maryland. Its voters have, have said, we do not want to retrocede to Maryland. In fact, the polling suggests that the residents of Maryland have said, we don't want the District of Columbia to retrocede to us either. So this is so crucial uh, that the right to vote is what is at stake here. The right to representation uh, is at stake here. Our soldiers have been overseas, fighting in Iraq, fighting in Afghanistan, fighting for democracy, fighting for the right to vote, fighting for the right to participate, for, the, for others to participate. What about right here in the United States of America? Why do we single out the residents of the District of Columbia? Forget the partisanship. Forget who will vote for who. That's not what's at stake. If we really truly want to be nonpartisan, we'll be like Lady Justice. We'll put a blindfold on as to how the residents of the District of Columbia might vote and affirm their fundamental right to vote without regard to who they may vote for. Thank you, Mr. Morial. A, a foundational principle of our nation that I, I think we can all agree on, it certainly was etched in the Declaration of Independence, is that government is derived uh, and governments derive from just powers and the just powers they have is from the consent of the people. Bottom line, it's from the consent of the people. Professor Primus, uh, in your written uh, testimony, you state that that principle, and I would say quote here, animates the whole Constitution and is the idea that Congress should be electorally responsible to the people for whom it legislates, end of quote. Professor, could you explain how D.C. statehood would fulfill our core democratic principles while also complying with the Founding Fathers' intent that there be an independent seat of government? I think you're on mute. Now, yeah, Senator. Good. Statehood would mean that D.C. residents who are American citizens can vote and be represented in Congress. It's that simple. And S-51 would mean that the Constitution's vision of a seat of government that is not part of any state would be maintained. We can have both. And if we can have both, then it doesn't seem to make sense to blame the Constitution if we decide not to have both. Because the Constitution lets us have both of those things. Um, we've heard a few times today um, that the Constitution doesn't give Congress the power to do this. But in fact, the Constitution does give Congress the power to do this. That's Article 4. Congress has the power to admit new states, and that's all this would be. So sometimes we've heard this discussed as if there was a really powerful set of incentives to admit D.C. statehood, but it can't be done because the Constitution doesn't permit it, and we would disrespect the Constitution to go forward. What actually disrespects the Constitution is to pretend that the Constitution says things that it doesn't, mm -hmm. that stop us from doing the right thing. The Constitution doesn't say that the seat of government has to be D.C. as we know it. The Constitution doesn't say anything about D.C. or where it has to be or how small it can be. The Constitution doesn't say that Article 4 permits Congress to admit new states, but not D.C. We've heard a number of times today D.C. is unique, but Article 4 doesn't say except D.C. All of those things that are raised as objections are actually not in the Constitution. The Constitution permits this, and a vision of representative government requires it. So Congress could decide to do it or not, but if Congress doesn't do it, Congress shouldn't say, we wish we could, but the Constitution prevents it. No one has identified anything in the Constitution that prevents it for the simple reason that nothing in the Constitution does prevent it. 
Thank you, President, uh, Professor Primus. Uh, Mayor Bowser, the professor has just mentioned nothing is uh, in the Constitution uh, that would prevent this from happening. So we also like to think about what perhaps were our founding fathers uh, thinking as they wrote this. So my question to you is, do you, do you believe that preserving the status quo in D.C., where, where residents have no voice uh, in their government, do you think that's what the Founding Fathers envisioned when they drafted and ratified the Constitution? Absolutely not, uh, Senator. We know, as, as we've already discussed, that ending taxation without representation uh, was a principle um, that led to the independence of our nation. Uh, and it's a glaring contradiction of our democracy that residents of the nation's capital, literally people who could look out of their windows and see this building, uh, don't have a, a, vo a vote in, or a voice in this chamber and no vote uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, and as the professor outlined, uh, it, is, it is very clear uh, that the Congress has the authority to ad admit new states, including Washington, D.C. Uh, and we know the time to correct that wrong is now. Mr. Morial uh, mentioned uh, men and women who are serving uh, in the military from, from the district now. And, and we know since uh, World War I, one, around 200,000 uh, brave men and women from Washington, D.C. Have, have served in the armed forces, uh, including uh, 11,000 uh, residents who are actively uh, serving right now and roughly 30,000 veterans uh, who live within the borders of D.C. Mayor Bowser, can, can you speak uh, to the service and to the sacrifice of your veteran constituents and, and the injustice that they face uh, as uh, they put their lives on the line to protect the rights uh, of others, and yet when they return to the city, those rights are actually being denied? Yes. Uh, so our Congresswoman spoke uh, very eloquently when she started. Uh, we represent 30,000 uh, veterans. Uh, we see D.C. residents sign up and volunteer for the armed forces every single day. Our residents go to service account uh, academies in service to their country. Uh, D.C. residents, you, you know, uh, Senator, aren't asking for special treatment. Uh, we are asking to be treated equally. Uh, we have stepped up in every case that we've been asked to serve uh, our country, and we want to continue uh, to be able to do that. Uh, when uh, D.C. residents have uh, two senators, uh, they can argue um, for better treatment for our veterans, not just our own, um, but veterans across America. Uh, we can stand shoulder to shoulder with you uh, to make sure the Veterans Administration has what it's needs what it needs, or like I like to see here in Washington, D.C., a, a world-class, state-of-the-art, new veterans hospital for Washington, D.C. Uh, we can be creative with you and our fellow Americans in addressing the needs of our veterans, including work and job training, job opportunities, and housing. Uh, we can promote innovative housing options like we've done right here in Washington, D.C., and share all of that learning uh, with our fellow uh, senators. Uh, so our admission to the union uh, is only going to enhance how our country um, really invests in and responds to our veterans. But imagine, uh, and I think when we were here the last time, we were, we were joined by members of our armed forces uh, who, when important measures come before this Senate, like, like Mayor Morial said, including uh, issues of war and peace, they have no voice here. Uh, and that is fundamentally unfair uh, to their service uh, and unfair to their citizenship. Thank you, Mayor. Senator Carper, you're recognized uh, for your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I we appreciate uh, your patience as a panel. Um, we're devoting them on a number of uh, bills, and so thank you for bearing with us. You bet. Come and go. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as, as well. I um, have one, one last question, if I could, for a doctor, for Professor Primus. Um, some folks are concerned that a statehood is uh, granted to, uh, to the District of Columbia. The federal district is, re and, and the district is reduced. The individuals living in the federal district will have outsized power 
due to the three electoral votes assigned to the district through the 23rd Amendment. Uh, our bill, S-51, would repeal the enabling statute for the 23rd Amendment and provide for expedited consideration of a joint resolution for the repeal of the amendment. Now, I understand that even if Congress does not move to repeal the 23rd Amendment, it has the authority to remedy that situation. Professor Primus, can you take a moment to address the options Congress has when it comes to dealing with the three electors assigned to the federal district and why you don't see this as a constitutional obstacle? Please. Yes, Senator, I'd be happy to. Um, first, best case scenario, I think everyone agrees, the 23rd Amendment should be repealed. And the good news is, um, if everyone agrees that it would be not a good situation to have a couple of dozen people name three electors for the presidency, and I think everyone does agree about that, uh, repeal ought to come pretty quickly. Um, if you think that we can't get repeal of the 23rd Amendment on those facts, it means that you don't believe that the Constitution can be amended at all. Um, and that's a proposition that I think few of us want to endorse. Now, until that happens, or secondarily, S-51, as presently written, takes the electors appointed pursuant to the 23rd Amendment out of the electoral count that ultimately names the president. That's an amendment that it makes statutorily. That's enough to prevent the situation where those electors distort the outcome of a presidential election, even if the 23rd Amendment is still on the books. Um, if the Congress wanted to do other things to make even more sure that there would be no problem under the 23rd Amendment, Congress has many options. Um, the Congress is in charge of legislation enabling, implementing the 23rd Amendment. So for example, um, Congress could provide by statute exercising that constitutional power that if there are electors named for the seat of government, that they will be legally instructed to vote for the candidate that would get the most electoral votes anyway. Um, that wouldn't be hard to do, and it would have the effect of making sure that it, those electors don't affect the electoral vote. Or Congress could, if it wanted to, decide that it would instruct those electors to vote for the winner of the national popular vote. And if necessary, you could specify what shall constitute the winner of the national popular vote. Um, it could even, in a symbolic measure, if it wanted to make the admission of DC into a further moment of affirming our connection to the framing of the Constitution, it could even direct those electors to, to vote for president for George Washington of Virginia and for vice president for John Adams of Massachusetts. That would not distort our current elections at all. Again, the best thing is simply for the 23rd Amendment to be repealed, but any of these solutions would do. And the concern that we can't find a solution for something for which there are many good solutions um, is the sort of thing that gets articulated, well, we don't want to find a solution. There are lots of easy solutions here, and S-51 already has one of them. Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, thank you, thank you. I want to thank again the, the, the panel, the mayor, everyone, all, all the witnesses on both sides, and uh, uh, Senator Lieberman as, as, as well, um, former Mayor Morial. Uh, Mr. Uh, I, I, I opened my statement by quoting uh, earlier today, uh, Mr. Chair Chairman, the words of Mark Twain. Uh, and I want to close with the words, if I could, of uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and, and Jefferson once said words uh, to this effect. He said, if the people know the truth, they won't make a mistake. If the people know the truth, they won't make a mistake. And our intent uh, in this hearing today is to better ensure that people know the truth. I think most people have no, in this country probably, if you ask them, they yeah, don't realize that the uh, District of Columbia has more uh, people living in it than a number of states. Most uh, people in this country probably don't realize that the uh, per capita income, on a per capita basis, the federal income taxes paid by residents of the District of Columbia are greater than any other state. Uh, most people don't realize that the, in this case, the leader of the District of Columbia doesn't have the authority to call the Delaware, the, yeah, I started the Delaware National Guard, the, the Washington uh, National Guard. Uh, there are any number of, uh, of things that people just don't realize. My guess is the framers, when they framed, when they were writing the Constitution, never would have imagined that uh, the District of Columbia would have this many people and to pay this much in taxes, but yet not have uh, the, uh, the opportunity to have a representation to vote in the House and, and the Senate. Um, this is a wrong that needs to be righted. 
And my hope is with the, uh, the information, some of the information, the knowledge that we're gaining from this, this uh, hearing and, and uh, others uh, going forward, that we'll make, uh, at the end of the day, we'll do the right thing. And uh, I, I close by with, with the words of William Wilberforce, not an American, but great British parliamentarian who for many years was a leader against slavery in, in Great Britain. And he said, uh, you, these words, uh, words of Wilberforce, 150 years ago, he said, uh, you may choose to look uh, the other way, but you can never again say uh, you did not know. Right. Uh, we want to sure, make sure that people, this, this voters, and we want to make sure the people of this country know and know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again for our witnesses. Much obliged. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you uh, uh, Senator Carper. Well, in, in closing out this hearing, I want to first uh, thank uh, Congresswoman uh, Norton for uh, your opening, uh, for your incredible leadership uh, over the, the years, and for passing significant legislation out of the House that we are now uh, in, the, in the process of uh, looking at here in the U.S. Uh, Senate. I also want to thank Senator Lieberman uh, for his leadership on the issues uh, over the years as well. Uh, and I want to thank each of our distinguished uh, uh, witnesses. This has been a, a great panel uh, that certainly has provided uh, perspective on this, in my mind, this fundamental civil rights issue that we discussed uh, here today. Uh, I think uh, the committee heard very compelling testimony on why Washington, D.C. should be admitted to the Union as the 51st state. Uh, in my mind, this shouldn't be viewed as a, as a partisan issue in any way. This is about ensuring that more than 7 100,000 American citizens who call Washington, D.C. home have an equal voice in this great democratic republic of ours. For far too long, these Americans have been denied our nation's most critical founding principle, the right to equal representation in government. We heard convincing testimony today that there are no constitutional obstacles to admitting Washington, D.C. as a state, and the importance of passing Senator Carper's legislation here in the Senate would right this long-standing wrong in our nation's history. Once again, I appreciate uh, our speakers. I appreciate uh, our witnesses for their input on this important issue. The record for this hearing will remain open for 15 days until July 7th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. And with that, this hearing Mr. Mr. Is Chairman, Mr. Chairman, before, before you do, can I just say one last sentence? A, thank, a word of thanks to D.C.'s uh, uh, shadow senators, Paul Strauss and Michael Brown, for their input uh, in, in anticipation of this hearing. We, we appreciate their input. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. With those final words, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.